feel free to raise your hand and ask a question of the speakers or the panelists. Um, and those of you who are tuning in online, please feel free to put your question in the chat. We have Lindsay over here who will be moderating that. Um, one note, uh, the last item on our agenda today is a tour of the main campus at AU. Um, and you may not be aware that AU is a designated arboretum that campus is. It's the only um, or the first urban campus, the largest research university that is carbon neutral, uh, which is pretty cool. And uh, co-leading the tour with my colleague, uh, Amy Morofisio, will be the manager of the Arboretum, who will point out all the strange and wonderful things that make it a sustainable campus. So um, after the program, we'll all meet in the lobby, um, we'll jump on a shuttle, go up to the campus, and we should be done with that between 4.15 and 4.30. So if you're at all able to stick around and join us for that, I think it will be very rewarding. Um, and now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff Long, the Vice Provost of Global and Immersive Studies, um, which is the uh, unit at AU that houses the Washington Semester Program. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I hope that you all have a wonderful night. Last night, um, as Toro just mentioned, that uh, AU has a really beautiful campus, and uh, uh, we are the first carbon neutral uh, uh, college in the state. So we are really proud of you know, being sustainable, and so hopefully that you can enjoy the tour a little bit. And the weather is doesn't really, you know, cooperate that much and uh, really chilly, but I do hope that you can find some time to enjoy a beautiful campus. Uh, again, that uh, I'm so delighted to see uh, all of you here uh, with our Washington Semester Program uh, Inter-Institutional Meeting. Uh, I'm sorry that if I repeat some, uh, the same language that I did in the last, uh, last night reception. Uh, we have many uh, partners joined online and in person. So it was really wonderful to, to be together uh, last night at the Ukraine House and get to know a little about each other and make connections. Uh, we learned last night that uh, one of our partner representatives who is here, uh, Dr. Uh, Joe Hanser, uh, talked to the current American ambassador to Ukraine, uh, Bridget Green, when uh, she was a student at the Kenyan College. So that's a, a wonderful uh, uh, story. So together with our uh, faculty and the staff, I welcome all of you to American University. Um, this is our first uh, inter-institutional meeting uh, since the fall of 2019. And the, the past several years have been really challenging for all of us in higher education and especially for our students. But we are proud to have continued our collaboration and our work, educating and connecting students across the nation and the world to their futures. So in January, we will enter our first uh, 77th year of uh, continuous operation uh, as American University Sports Student Semester Program. Um, experiential learning is really a hallmark uh, for our students' experience at American University. About 91% of AU undergraduates and 56% of our graduate students have had at least a one time uh, internship here uh, abroad. We also send about uh, 65 to 70 percent of students abroad to have this immersive learning. Um, so, among all the internship programs, the Washington Semester Program is really the front door with a distinctive history and reputation. Um, so I'm very grateful to have you here with us to continue our long running cooperation about how we can continue to serve your students academically and professionally. We like to work with each of you to ensure that we are well positioned to continue as a premier offering to your students. And we are integrated into your curriculum and the operations of, our, of your university in a seamless way uh, as much as possible. So we call Washington, D.C. as our classroom. We all know that uh, Washington, D.C. is more than ever relevant uh, at the national and the international level in today's world. Um, Washington Smith program is really committed to working with you and your institution. We need your energy and engagement 
to help the program move forward and continue to create life-changing experience for your students while they are with us. So thank you again for uh, joining us today. And I'm very happy to hand it over to our wonderful program director, uh, Amy Morel Bejo. Uh, Amy has worked in AU uh, experiential learning for 28 years. Uh, early in her career, she managed the AU study abroad program with distinctive, distinctive high impact practices. And for most of her career, she managed internship services and career readiness opportunities for thousands of students uh, in Washington's medical program. So she served as the interim director uh, since the last October. And this summer, she was appointed as a director to oversee this historical program with a modern act. So to me. And, Perhaps like you, you're coming to Washington as students do and as we often do to see the sights. But what really happens here is we all turn inwards and get some insights. So welcome to what we hope is an insightful experience for you um, in the day ahead. We're so pleased to share ideas with one another. Um, so for me, after about um, 28 years of service, I am eager to learn from my advantage point about what you have to say about the program. We want to take it all in. We know that, again, Washington, D.C. can be flashy and exciting. Students arrive here. They want to take selfies in front of the, the monuments and buildings. Um, but what happens is more important with the faculty. The faculty teach students to take sides and also be tolerant. Our students learn how to assess and learn what's happening from a factual point of view. They're learning the policy perspectives and what's happening in Washington from an academic and a, a very real world perspective. Our students are um, leading these immersive seminars. That's the secret sauce of the Washington semester program. When students come to DC, they really get excited about, again, the big names about what happens in DC, but then they walk away with excitement about what they've learned in their seminars because we are faculty or gems. But let me start first with a, a little bit of an introduction with our staff. Um, our beloved staff are also essential in building students' readiness for careers, their maturity, and it, we also help make sure that AU is your campus in the U.S. capital city. So students are learning these skills to be mature and independent, but we have a safety net. And let me begin, too, with, um, with our folks, with our colleagues here. I think I'll go in alpha order. Um, alphabetically, I'm starting with Italia Rababa. If you would, stand up, Italia. Um, Italia is our beloved advisor. She has a social work background. And from that background, is so um, wise to help students feel at home in DC. And she refers students to housing options in addition to doing academic advising. Students gain these life skills and independence in high-end buildings. You'll hear about them. They um, impress us. And Sarah and I are trying to find a way for um, a middle-aged apartment <laughs> building to be open for a weekend to see so we can have a weekend off. Um, they're quite lovely. And Natalia does a smooth transition to there. Um, most students do live in the turnkey housing options. And with this provider, Natalia is again helping them figure out how to navigate a shining and also sometimes a grimy capital city. So students don't have um, as adult skills from the semester. Um, not here, but still a new part of our, of our team, Julia Rahim today. She is an admissions and onboarding coordinator. She's a DC local. She had a conflict. She'll be back and you can reach her at any time. Our, um, Team is very much available for Zoom meetings, for phone calls and emails, et cetera. Of course, um, next here we have Karen Carter. We're thrilled that she's um, in person today, our internship advisor. Um, check out her secrets of internship success and many of the other dozens of activities 
that are happening for sparkling connections with students um, really helps students discover how they go from here to career. We have Lindsay Allen here, who is our WSP influencer, and she um, puts, puts us on the map in social media. And check out her fun style on Instagram. Um, and also remember that we really want to like you on social. And so make sure that when you're seeing a post of your student, one of your um, students that you sent here, that we would love for you to engage and, and have a back and forth about that. So do connect with us, find us online. Um, also here, uh, another internship advisor is Meg Pagromas, and Meg here just recently joined our team. She focuses on employer engagement. She just um, hosted a hot session with the Environmental Protection Agency, and that, that session looked at green careers, and us, the site like EPA said um, to our exclusive audience, they said, now we really only take our Washington semester students because the students you send us are top tier. So we're very grateful that you help us partner with employers in unique ways to get the best access to internships. Um, Shadi Akhtar, who was always kind of in the background, but I think you'll see her in person. She was on last night. She's the marketing and operations um, leader. She does the creative marketing strategies as well as the operational communication functions and the themes of our program of career readiness. DC is a classroom, um, sights and sounds of the city and life skills all come from the brilliance of Shadi Akshar's talents. And then of course, um, we also have some other wonderful staff in our office, including Nira Hoxa, who I think um, Nira's around here, and she supports OGIS overall, and you might be meeting Love um, and others. And at this point, too, I do want to just extend another um, heartfelt sense of gratitude to the amazing Terrell Austin, who's been phenomenal at leading this. So thank you so much, Terrell, for, for your leadership today and always with partners. Um, and now that we've um, covered our staff, and we're just going to do a transition over to our esteemed faculty. And the faculty are going to introduce themselves. And I'm going to pass it to the Carol to transition to that, that next step. Thank you. Um, we have uh, this morning um, John Calgary Gulliver and Adam here, who will tell you a bit about their seminars. And John is going to go first because it has to rush out to class. Um, so, John, do you want to come up here and uh, speak at this podium and then everyone else? Yeah. You can grab a mic too if you want. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm John Calgary. I am uh, under rest. <laughs> and uh, I'm prepared. <laughs> and in that way, I managed to sort of maintain my rapport with my students. I, I've been uh, with the Washington Semester Program for 26 years, so I'm also uh, probably the old guy in the shop. I've taught the uh, U.S. Foreign Policy Seminar for many years, although not in recent years. Um, supervised research projects for many years, dozens and dozens of them. Uh, taught the internship course as well in the regular academic session and in the summer. And uh, this semester, I talked myself into doing something a little bit different. So let me just tell you in 30 seconds or more, uh, what this, which, you know, of course, which is what academics do, um, what this, this different thing is. Uh, I developed an elective course, an evening elective for the Washington semester students, uh, which is entitled The United States and the World in an Era of Great Power Competition. And, you know, basically, um, you know, my mind operates when it operates at all uh, in a kind of a geometric or map, map, map making way. And so just to give you a sense of uh, what that course is about, it's about the triangular relationship between the United States, China and Russia. Uh, in an era in which these relationships are not only in transition, but concerning everybody here in the Washington policy establishment. Um, and um, it, the, the course has really gone exceptionally well. Uh, initially, I had six students enrolled. The, 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 the enrollment jumped to 10, then to 12, then to 15, and then to 17. Um, 
that in itself is not remarkable, but what's remarkable is also, I think, uh, you know, quite common in my 26 years of experience in the Washington semester program. And, and that is what, what's always jazzed me about the program is that the students come from different family backgrounds, uh, different towns and cities and rural areas in the United States, uh, different colleges and universities, different academic disciplines, even when they're actually majoring in the same academic discipline, the kind of preparation that they have or the perspectives that they have developed over time, it's, it's completely different. And 25 to 30 years ago, uh, I, well, probably 25, yeah, 25, 30 years ago, the program was internationalized, which means that, you know, seven or eight of my students, 17, uh, come from, you know, foreign countries. And, and so for a course like mine, where we're talking about international relations and about Russia and the Ukraine war and about the flashpoints of conflict in East Asia, notably Taiwan, you know, you're going to get a whole sort of potpourri of, uh, of views and also levels of preparation. And what's really stunned me about this semester is uh, that though the students, you know, come from all these different backgrounds and here in Washington, they don't even all live in the same dorm. Uh, they, and they arrive at 5.30 for class, many of them after a full day of internship, uh, you know, which is work. They're jazzed. Uh, they, they're ready to, to learn, but more importantly, they're ready to exchange their views, to raise important questions, to make presentations. And so, you know, if you have any doubts about whether in the post-pandemic world, uh, the Washington semester doesn't offer what it used to offer or uh, what it offers, you know, I can tell you from personal experience, I'm not here really to market the program or to market myself. Uh, I actually enjoy the course. It's turned out as, you know, as well, if not really better than I had anticipated. Amy said to me, you know, what would you like to teach next year? I said, well, let me develop another elective course. So uh, I have a few other ideas for elective courses. I would highly recommend that if your students are looking to sort of um, combine the traditional seminar here in the Washington semester with the internship and they need to sort of, you know, obtain academic credit for something else, the something else I think, I think it works. And so uh, maybe if you want, I can kind of, if, if there are any questions, I can answer them about the content of the course, the way in which I've developed the curriculum or anything else. Uh, happy to take a few questions because then I, I do have to run because I know my students don't really want me to come to class, but I have to go because it starts at 945. Uh, and my email, by the way, I'm like uh, addicted to email. So, and, and my email address is very easy to remember. Uh, it's Cal, like the first three letters of my surname, at American.edu. So is there anything else, anything I can answer or... Yeah. I'll do it. Yeah, please. I have one question about your uh, what you said about your post content, and uh, because you say a great power competition, and then U.S. and China and Afghanistan, but why did do you include Russia? Ah, um, sure. Is yeah. that, that kind of what that needs to be correct the Washington atmosphere? Yeah, because you know I'm a policy monk, and I live in Washington D.C., and I read what the um policymakers actually say, even though I don't necessarily agree with how they prioritize issues, but you know, the national security strategy established this. And so my students read the national security strategy and they send from there, right? The course takes off. Uh, and so, you know, among the things, I mean, it's a great question and it's interesting how the, the, the class has sort of divided on some of these issues. So for example, the European students are just consumed as you might expect. Uh, for them, you know, Russia is the it, it is it is the is the immediate concern, and you could say the immediate threat. And so, when they look at the national security strategy, they're seeing it through the vantage points of their own personal experiences. The American students are preoccupied with China, and when I give them like activities, because what I do is I develop a set of. Uh, a set of topics that I want them to independently, individually, and then in small teams, like do, do research on. 
you know, you can see the European students gravitating to things that have to do with Russia, whether it's, you know, the Wagner Group's uh, intrusion into Africa or whatever, but the American students interested in other things. So those students who come to my class, for example, interested in US-China relations, some of them are studying economics. So they're more attuned to the economic, um, uh, the economic tensions or frictions between the two countries. And, and when I ask them, like, what would you like to do your presentation on? And I give them a set of topics. You know, they want to do something, for example, on, you know, semiconductors and critical minerals and, and, and that type of stuff. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Nobody else? Extra credit? <laughs> no? Okay, let me, let me end with like one quick story. Uh, so, so someone here, but I'm not going to say who, uh, 20 something years ago was a student of mine. Um, and that person, the story is partly for that person, but partly for you. When people do the Washington semester, they, they really never leave. It. Uh, and the, the age of the internet, and I'm older than the internet, but since the age of the internet, what's amazing is how many of my students have remained in contact with each other and have remained in contact with me. And on LinkedIn, I received this lengthy message from a former student of mine who was well known to a person sitting in this room, named Shira Goldberg, who was a student from McGill University in my foreign policy class, who has recently had twins. She's now a mother of four, but she holds a senior position in the Canadian Foreign Service. And naturally she's on, because it's Canada, like a five-year maternity. <laughs> so she writes to me and, and tells me about like a wedding she's been at. And, and the person who had gotten married is another former student of mine. Who, and and, and she, she goes and lists all of the people that she's remained in contact with. And we're talking about, you know, 20 years or 18 years since she was in my class. So I, I think what's really cool about the program is that people forge personal relations here. Uh, and they do go back to their home schools and some of them are actually stunned at the disjuncture between like what they've done here and where they're going back home. But they do remain in contact with, with each other and with me. And, and frankly speaking, I have to say, uh, that's really the diamond in the rough for the, as far as I'm concerned for the program. So thanks a lot for coming. I'm sorry I can't stay, stay later, but you probably wouldn't want to hear me talk anymore anyway. <laughs>
Um, so this class is, again, based on this diversity of different topics. I take the students to, this is a great place, obviously, so John uh, mentioned how it's important for geopolitics, but it's also important for peace and conflict resolution. Um, and I take students to institutions like United States Institute of Peace, um, be engaged and, uh, you know, with the, be engaged with the experts there. This semester, for instance, we went to talk to the desk of Afghanistan. We talked to very high level senior researchers uh, and program leaders there. And students have a chance to ask the most difficult questions about, you know, what's going on about refugees, what's going about with foreign policy regarding uh, Afghanistan. So it, it's that kind of, you know, environment where students really immerse themselves into those organizational, you know, uh, you know, organizations, but also immerse themselves into how politics is made in DC, trying to understand, you know, um, uh, the balance between, uh, you know, different actors and different perspectives in DC environment. Um, I also pay a lot of attention to um, try to make my course as diverse as possible. Uh, and when I invite guest speakers, I usually look at their background and try to make sure that I am as diverse as possible in terms of their political backgrounds, in terms of their you know identities. Um, so uh, we have speakers from different places. So recently, we had two very significant speakers, for instance, from um, human, the Human Rights Watch. Uh, so our speaker came and talked about China's policy, human rights issue, issues in China. And um, she also talked about gender issues in China. Uh, and a second speaker, for instance, was from International Rescue Committee. So he came here to talk about uh, what International Rescue Committee does, how do they deal with refugee issues, um, what kind of missions they have, what other projects they have. So they, they give us this kind of background, but students really enjoy listening. This very, you know, um, real, very grassroots organization, perspective of these grassroots organizations to hear how they make change, because change is really important for this age group. They wanted to make a change in the world and they wanted to understand how they can uh, build a link between their background and what's going on in DC. They try to make a bridge, so they are really getting inspired by all this, uh, you know, the change makers. Let's as they say. Uh, we also go go to DC for think tanks uh, because this is the world of think tanks, obviously. And every week there are wonderful events. I'm not going for them. I'm going for myself, actually. But I'm not. I'm not telling them there are a lot of events. So I, we are using this time to really immerse ourselves this DC environment and get the most out of it. But classroom is also fun. Uh, I mean, fun for me, but I don't know what good it is. Uh, so we do a lot of simulations, in, you know, classroom activities, role plays, and in group, like small group activities, large group activities. But simulations are at the heart of my class. Uh, what we do is, uh, sometimes we do some simulations in the classroom, but sometimes, I do collaborations with some organizations in DC. For instance, we have a North Korea US simulation in that President Trump is gonna uh, uh, you know, have a negotiation with uh, Kim Jong-un uh, in order to denuclearize North Korea. So this is the simulation that we are doing. So Simpson Center has a Korea program. I collaborated with them. They created simulation for students. So actually, after Thanksgiving, students are starting this big project. They started to learn about the conflict. They try to get into the shoes of their roles. And then at the end of the semester, this is our major, major simulation. We are going to go to Simpson Center. They're so kind that they, they give us space for this activity and they help us actually be experts. Uh, Korea experts are helping us to do this simulation. I am more like technical support, how to do negotiation, how to talk, what is the you know cultural sensitivities there. Uh, but they are the ones who are leading, for instance, the North Korea related aspect, how to, what is right, what is wrong, what to say is correct, or what to say is appropriate in that environment. So students are actually immersing themselves to the DC environment through this activity, but they learn a lot about North Korea US uh, relations and South Korea in general. Um, so this is just an example, but I think it's a great uh, case study for us to learn the case, get the most out of DC, and apply what we learn in the classroom. 
So this is one example. What we did, we have other you know simulations in the class too. My class is not uh, covering a lot of topics from arms control to gender issues to um, uh, doing practice about you know conflict prevention, third party interventions, peace building. So we kind of covered a lot of issues in this class, a lot of topics in this class. Very lively class, lots of activities. So my purpose was to be culturally sensitive too, because I know I was, uh, I know uh, what it means to be an international student, uh, because I came to this this country as an international student. So knowing this actually gives me a lot of actually you know sensitivity about what they might feel, uh, what it means to come from Germany, staying here. I know that some of them are getting, you know, they're missing their families, their dogs, their cats, you know, I know what it means. So I'm trying to also kind of build this bridge between student and me uh, out of classroom in a way that they feel like they're home. Um, so uh, what else I can say? Um, uh, so as I said, it's a class is also very uh, uh, multi-diverse, multi-perspective. So we are looking at uh, you know high-level uh, issues. We are talking about how governments make decisions, but we also look at like how grassroots make decisions. How do they contribute to the change, and how DC actually allows us to uh, uh, you know see all these changes. So this is what I'm going to say. Uh, if you're interested in, um, you know, if you have any questions, probably I can answer those questions. Uh, but this is all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Any questions? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, so you talk about a lot about the um, opportunities here about for all in policy making. Um, at the same time, um, Washington is also at the center of like uh, immigrant group politics, a lot. lobbying. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then especially the current like, conflict in Israel and Gaza, yeah. uh, um, interest group politics is a lot. center, right? So, uh, could you talk a little bit about the opportunity for students uh, to uh, for um, uh, interest groups? in the Yeah, definitely. So first of all, I think, um, you know, I'm coming from Turkey originally. So being close to the region uh, is giving me more, you know, sensitivity to talk about these topics from a more academic, you know, angle. But also I know the culture. I know, you know, what's going on uh, on the ground. I watch everything, you know, uh, every day very closely. And it's my field, the conflict resolution. So I, I'm extra, extra sensitive. Uh, but I think, you know, we, we need to approach all of these issues from an academic perspective. And I try to take students to places where they can get multiple perspectives about those issues. Um, so, for instance, um, USIP was a great place to be. It's a um, bipartisan in a way, actually funded by the, uh, the Congress. Uh, so they're not Republican, they're not Democrats. So they are getting uh, more, uh, let's say, object perspective, objective perspective. Uh, on all of these sensitive issues, not only israel palestinian conflict, all of the conflicts in the world is actually very sensitive. And you can look at it from your own window. Um, but for us in this classroom, because it's very skill-based, we are trying to understand like how to approach those conflicts, what escalation means, what it means to well, polarization, for instance, what polarization means, how polarization turns into you know, uh, conflict suddenly, why conflicts erupting this way? What is terrorism? What is not? So we are discussing this based on, of course, like class readings and listening experts who are coming from this kind of background, giving us more, you know, unique perspectives, trying to understand all these conflicts uh, from relatively objectively as possible. Um, and we talk about humanitarian law, we talk about uh, international law, we talk about international institutions and their role. So everything we look at, all of these concepts are sensitive, but we are looking at it from a very academic perspective, try to understand each other. Okay. And I actually, these topics are so sensitive to talk in the classroom, uh, but I think we create this uh, respect uh, because in the classroom to listen to each other without judging and then you know building on top of each other's ideas in a constructive way, because this is how you, feel trust you know in the community in order to say something raise your voice um so i think we could create that kind of environment so if i can also give you a feedback about this uh, it's very important to create this in-group dynamic first in order to talk about difficult conversations yeah one more well, 
John was better than me in attractive questions, I guess. <laughs> okay, so I'm here until uh, 9.50. I also have a site visit today. So we are going to George Washington University because they have a wonderful event on Syrians in exile. So there's gonna be a conversation that our UN representative will be there, some scholars will be there. So we're gonna listen to them, we're gonna ask questions to them. And after that, I have already my uh, practice materials with me. We're gonna find a place, hopefully, silent place in, in the university and we will do our uh, conflict intervention activity. So it's really like, you can see how, um, you know, we, we are very flexible. Uh, we are adjusting to new uh, situations in this program. So if we need to have a site visit, we also can have a class activity there. So it's really like, you know, if you're able to manage this, it's, it's really fun to get the most out of DC, but also be in the classroom. So, all right, thank you so much. Hello everyone, morning. Um, my name is Adam Sharon, and John Calabrese was talking about me. Um, <laughs> I, I was a student in 1998. Um, so I am a graduate of the Washington Semester Program. I uh, was at McGill University in Montreal. There was a partnership relationship between McGill and, and this program. Uh, and I came here uh, to study in the Foreign Policy Program. And the headline is the program changed my life. That's how I begin the first class of uh, every semester that I teach here. I tell the students the program changed my life. So how did it change my life? What did I do that semester? How am I back here now teaching class? It opened my eyes to opportunities that I did not know exist. Um, I had no idea of profession, um, industries, <clears throat> fields, uh, points of view until I got here. And then very quickly, I realized, OK, I'm here for a finite period. I had four months left, I think it was, three and a half, four months. I need to maximize my time when I'm here. Go to events, go to think tank events, network, meet people. There's the proverbial asking people out for coffee and students are, are thinking that I'm a student and they're a professional. There's a 25 year age gap. How, how does that work? But that's the currency of this place. That's what is the lifeblood of Washington DC. There is a networking element to the city. Everyone began as an intern. They were lifted up by a person or people. Maybe these are uh, graduates of your home university. Uh, maybe it's a connection through religion, clubs, uh, uh, fraternities. So whatever that connection is, there is a real interest in the town that People might think, oh, it's politics. Politics can be ugly, right? Politics can be messy. There's nothing pretty about it. That may be in some areas, but in terms of helping students take that next step or advance, in terms of getting a meeting, having that turn into another internship, having that turn into a job, that happens here. That's what happened for me. Um, I did, as I mentioned, the foreign policy program with John Calabrese. Um, the way the, the class was structured, I remember it vividly. Every week was another issue of the world. The readings reflected that. The lectures and the seminars reflected that. Our site visits reflected that. And then we interned uh, for the remaining days of the week. I think that it was two days, now it's three days. And that experience all of a sudden taught me, okay, I don't think I want to do, I know what it was. I don't want to be a lawyer. Um, I don't want to go to law school. I don't want to take the LSAT. There's a whole world here um, that connects to issues I'm interested in, which was this uh, nexus between foreign policy, foreign affairs, and communications. And when I did my internship here, that internship was in journalism. I was able to cover the end of the Clinton White House and a whole bunch of other things, and it was a fascinating time. But I realized, okay, how do I how do I leverage this? How do I maximize this? And then the semester ended. And then I had to go back home for a year and a half to my university. But I basically made a very conscious decision that I, I wanna I wanna come back. Um, and that's another thing I talk to my students about is 
beginning of the semester. Uh, and I challenge them, propose the question, I want you to be able to answer after the semester. I love it here, and I want to come back. I don't love it here. I had a great time, yeah. But I don't love it here, and I don't think I want to come back. And both answers are equally good. Because it get, they give students clarity of, of where they think they want to go in that stage after graduation. That, that's a wonderful thing. I'm all for that. So I, I went back to school, finished uh, my degree, a year and a half, and then I came back. And where I entered, which was at a radio news organization, is where I got a job. That's a nice story, too. Uh, and that happens if you're an enterprising intern, do good work, get recognized, and then remain in contact in, in a manageable way with your internship supervisor. You're not going to write them every week. You're not going to write them every month. A little excessive, but once, twice a year, follow up, check in. Hey, I thought about you. Hey, um, I, I noticed your organization hosted this event. I'm in Montreal. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm in Seattle, but I'm following and I, I noticed it. That makes a difference. And then when I came back here, I worked, as I mentioned, and then I realized, oh my goodness, there are graduate programs in foreign affairs that don't take you on the track to be a PhD. I, I do not have a doctorate, but to take you on a track where you can combine foreign affairs, in my case, communications, conflict resolution, uh, environment, climate, uh, whatever your interest is, um, and set you up for working in a professional setting, not an academic setting, which is where I went. Um, and, and AU has a wonderful program. GW has a wonderful program. Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, SICE. Um, all these programs are here in DC. And that was another thing I learned while I was here. I'm here. Uh, there are many universities here as an undergrad. I always encourage my students, go visit these graduate schools. Again, that might be valuable because you want to go there one day might be valuable because you never want to go there one day, but you're here, go learn and get answers to those questions. Um, I'll, I'll get to what I teach in a moment, but professionally, it all, it did come together. Uh, foreign affairs, communication, all kick started by the AU program. Uh, and for me in my career, I'm now in the private sector, but spent 12 years in Congress working as the communications director for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and then the House Foreign Affairs Committee before that. Um, none of that would have been possible without this program. I would not have even known such a job existed, um, but it opened my eyes, which is a great thing. So now I teach a class. I, I put my hand up. I got in contact with John Calabrese when I uh, moved back here and kept in touch and said, I'd love to impart whatever knowledge I've been able to pick up and the experiences to the students. I, I don't approach the class that I've designed, which is called uh, Political Transitions. It's how, how Washington navigates political transitions after elections. I don't approach it from, and I don't want to say, I'll, I don't want to make this sacred. I, I don't approach it from an academic se um, uh, sensibility in that I don't have a doctorate. I'm not um, providing the academic or theoretical readings or lectures. My goal is to make it very um, tangible, make it very focused on careers and what students can or cannot do and how they can learn that how Washington DC changes during the times of elections and political transition. So I'm very mindful of taking the students, I think there's 22 um, this semester, which is, which is a good number, to experience different aspects of how Washington DC navigates transition. Um, last week, it was what happens in the think tank community when it goes from one party to another. Next week, it's the head of public policy at YouTube to talk how the tech industry navigates the change from a Democrat to a Republican and Republican to Democrat. Um, I had a, a friend who I actually interned with, uh, who's from Iowa, uh, who was very much in the, the Trump orbit. I mean, like on the plane with the president eating Big Macs when he was a candidate. That's a whole nother story. Um, and his insight is valuable and I want to hear it. And the class needs to hear it. And an equivalent from 
um, a person in the Biden or the Obama world. I'm very mindful. It's how I've worked, lived, practiced my profession um, to operate within very strict guardrails in terms of the speakers that I bring in. Um, I'm all for different points of view. We have that, but I'm very much all for civility and respect and dialogue and having the right people, the right sensibility, even if they work for one administration or another, work at one institute or another, we have to find a way um, to, to manage that conversation in, in the right way. I'll, I'll leave you with a, a few more points and I'll open it up to questions also. Um, I am very cognizant of, of what it is to be a student in this program for obvious reasons um, and trying to figure out what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to do after graduation? And so I'm very um, consistent. <clears throat> um, I, I make this offer also in the first day of class um, to, to the class and students. Let me take you out for coffee. I bought and we're going to go over your career plan and what you want to do and what makes sense. And then I'm going to give you three contacts of people who are in DC, and I'm going to connect you with them. And you're going to go meet them, have coffee with them, Zoom with them, and add, have your questions answered about job, future, graduate school. Do you take a break from undergrad to graduate school? Is graduate school worth it? Uh, should I come here? Should I go abroad? Should I go to another? What is it like working on Capitol Hill? Are campaigns really that? Like, answer these questions that you have as a 19, 20, 21 year old beginning to formulate, but you don't really know what does it all really mean. So, I'm very mindful of, of making those connections, um, which, you know, one connection might lead to three, might lead to five, and that's how that internship turns into a job, turns into a second job. And then, and then you're off and running. And then the onus is on the student. That's the bargain I make with them. That they have to then pay it forward for people who are coming up and that's that's how I um, approach the class, school, and the the time here. Um, I gather everyone here is from a U.S. university. I'm also very mindful that we have students from Europe. Um, usually three to five students per class. Um, and I I also do a I'm cognizant that their experience are going to be it's going to be different. The way they learn is different than their American counterparts. The likelihood of them coming back here is not as great as an American student coming back here. Um, so I've also just been mindful to connect those students with, as an example, their German counterparts who did the program five, 10 years ago, who were my former students, so they can have a dialogue going as well. That's what I have. It was a great program. Again, I'll, I'll end where I began. Um, a headline for me changed my life, changed the trajectory of my life professionally, personally, um, <laughs> and um, and I'm, I'm forever thankful. So I, I hope um, I hope you can impart that to your students uh, when you go back. Home. Any questions? Can you clap? <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Uh, email. Uh, I'll give you my email. I'll give you my phone number too. You can follow me. You can text me. It's no problem. Um, email is the last name, Sharon, S H A R O N, at American.edu. Uh, phone is 202 258 0616. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Okay. At this time, I'd like to invite um, the members of our first panel to come up um, to the front. And I should have said at the beginning that please feel free to take a break at any time. We do not feel in break. I'm in mean, lunch, but as uh, so we have coffee, come back in. We're going to start with our um, our partner panel here in one minute. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. I have to find out if the students are meeting. I think no, this it's a little awkward. Yeah.
permission to share her video yeah, one virtual attendance to you too. Oh, okay. Melissa Gatey from the Leadership Center at Merritt College. I know I have to think about that on this. I know she's really excited that we it was so without realizing that 
Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and get started um, with our partner panel. Um, one of the best things about what I get to do for the program is travel around and meet partners um, and visit campuses and uh, get the lay of the land about what's happening elsewhere um, outside of Washington. And um, the idea for this panel actually sprung out of a conversation I had um, with our rep at Emory University, it's in the political science department. And he had just been given the newly created role as the director of experiential education for political science. Um, they created that role for him. And I thought that was interesting. And I said, why, you know, why did they do that? And he said, because Emory is implementing uh, experiential education graduation requirement starting in 2025. Um, and uh, Washington semester program, he said, is uh, meets that criteria, really qualifies. Other experiences also qualify, service learning, many other things. But I thought that was interesting. And so I've been interested in talking to partners around um, the United States about what's happening on their campus with regard to high impact practices and experiential education. And so I'm really excited to have the people who are here um, because they are working on campuses where interesting things are happening, where collaborations are happening. Sometimes um, my contact at a university is just um, uh, someone in study abroad or someone in political science or someone in the career center. Um, but on some campus, there's a lot of collaboration among units going on, uh, people working together to provide experiences for students and uh, encourage students to come to Washington, D.C. Um, so I'm not going to, um, I'll let our panelists introduce themselves with the exception of Dr. Melissa Gakey, who is a tuning from Marist College virtually. Um, she is the director of the Leadership Center there um, and she will be speaking um, before you, Lydia, after Kevin, uh, mm -hmm. Melissa. So that's how we will uh, work this out. But first, I'd like to kick off with uh, Dr. Paul Heron from Providence College of Political Science. Yeah. So I am uh, Paul Heron from Providence College. I teach in the political science department. I'm also the pre-law advisor for uh, for the for the college. I I took over the uh, the position as the director of the Washington Semester Program a year ago, um, and so I'm still kind of um, you know, trying to put new uh, practices into place and locate students and identify people who would be uh, kind of good candidates to send to Washington. And, and in many ways, that's our, that's the, um, that's the biggest challenge that we have uh, is, you know, it's not the program, as you've seen from the, the presentation so far, the program itself is fabulous. It's trying to find uh, the students who we can uh, kind of channel toward the program. Um, and there are a couple of things that I wanted to kind of touch on as not just not just kind of projects, but challenges at, at DC that I'm not sure if they uh, exist elsewhere if you're interested in the conversation. Um, we have a uh, kind of global learning program that sends students abroad. And well, you know, the the kind of Washington semester program sits outside of them. So I, I manage that and we're kind of separate from the resources of the international program. So, you know, luckily I have my partner, Liz Lombard, to help me uh, identify students and kind of bring them into our orbit. But it's, but it's um, you know, one of the things that the challenge is trying to um, uh, kind of run that without the the kind of institutional support, and I'm and that that's one of the things I'm trying to kind of build up at PC and um, and kind of uh, make those connections work in a in a in a in a more efficient way. In terms of what the program does for our students, we have a um, we have a variety of internship requirements through the political science department that they can meet in the in the uh, Washington semester program. And they have <laughs> they uh, they have better experiences here than they do in in Providence or in even in, in Boston if they're if they're doing internship opportunities over the summer. Um, it's been a 
a, a kind of you know every every student that I've that I've dealt with that's that's been through this program has um, has come out ahead of the students that have stayed back in in Providence in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of the the actual experience with the internship uh, and it has kind of changed as as the last speaker indicated it's changed the direct trajectory of so many of their lives and careers I have so many students that end up back in uh, Washington working in Washington uh, because of the connections they made during this program um, as a as a kind of I don't I won't give his name but as an additional kind of uh, story related to the Washington semester program I had lunch with one of my one of my one of my students who um, uh, who came down to, to GW for law school and then practiced practiced in a big firm in Boston. He's back in um, in Providence for the year, clerking for a federal judge. And so we had lunch a couple of weeks ago, and he's there with his wife. And I had not met his wife, and I asked him, "Well, how did you meet your wife?" And he said, "Oh, you didn't know." I met her at the Washington semester program. <laughs> but so it's uh, you know, the students that the students even, you know, now that I've now that I've been working directly with the program, the students that I've been working with have had such amazing experiences. Uh the students that I knew before, just as the political science professor, uh also had amazing experiences. Um, and it's been um, you know, you know, it's it's really not the, there's not something to it. The, the, the adjustments that I have to make are all uh, kind of at the home institution to kind of funnel students to this kind of great program. The, um, uh, the other piece that, that, that I try to connect to is the, is the, is the pre-law program. And I do that for two reasons. One, students who are interested in law tend to be interested in getting to Washington, and there are a variety of internship opportunities and class opportunities that are helpful to students who want to go to law school. Two, it's great if students have experiences that make them not go to law school. Um, <laughs> and that's not to say, I, I'm not trying to talk, I, I try to be neutral in my, in my advising for law school. Um, but I do, one of the things I, 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 I often try to do, and I think is a, is, is, is a personal, and I'm trying to make it an institutional goal, is to encourage students to take a year or two between college and law school or college and graduate school generally. Um, it's often hard to convince them to do that. The sending them to Washington for a semester accomplishes some of that goal. They go and they live somewhere else, they work, they have experiences that will kind of give them a better idea of what they want to do next. Um, and so that has been a really kind of uh, a helpful way for me to think about, about what we want to do in, in partnership with, with this group. Hi, I'm Liz Lombard. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm the Associate Director of Diversity, Inclusion and Early Engagement at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. So I've been working um, with Carol and the um, wonderful Washington Semester Program for maybe about three or four years, um, assisting Carol and assisting um, now Paul, before it was Joe. And so I'm a little kind of odd out here being I'm probably the only person here from a career center, but my role with this program is to market, educate the students to get them to apply. Um, so I have, and I will get into that, right? I'm doing just an introduction. Oh, okay. So I'm, um, so I, and I've lived in the DC area for 20 years. So I'll get on my soapbox about how great Washington DC is and the metro area. And then also talking about the, the benefits and the value of being part of the Washington semester program. There are two students, um, well, there are alums now, but one just started here, Andres Heredia, and he just got down here um, a couple of weeks ago, and he's working on Capitol Hill. So he did the program last year, went home reluctantly because he didn't have a full-time job, and now he's here. And then the other one, she's been here, I think, four or five years, um, and she was working for grassroots advocacy, so Lauren Barbosa, and she also... Um, is getting her master's at George Washington University and um, public, uh, public health. 
Yeah, so um, I want to ask you, both of you here, um, how do you work together um, at Providence College? Because you're in the Career Center, Liz, and you're in the Political Science Department, Paul. How does that work? So you want to go there? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I I can't reach as many students as Liz can. Uh, we, you know, I, 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 I mean, one of the reasons that I'm well positioned to be the director of the program is because of my pre-law role, I deal with students from lots of different majors and that's helpful. But I also want to get kids who are not pre-law, right? Or who are not interested in law school or haven't even thought about law school because this program is, it can be helpful for a whole variety of majors. So having a point person in the career center is, you know, kind of extremely important from my perspective. So we have a, an awesome team. We're a team of uh, 12 in the career center at Providence College, and we have a great marketing communications person and a GA and students. So they do all the marketing for this. So when I'm ready to queue it up and Terrell's coming on campus um, to do an info session, or for the expo, um, our career expo, she, um, the person in our office, puts together all of the marketing materials and then blasts it out. So we um, we have a weekly newsletter where it goes in. Um, we have a TV slot outside our office where we're featuring the Washington Semester Program. We also do, this is brand new, um, we do what we call a rapid recap roundup. Um, and that's done on Fridays where two of our student workers will interview each other and talk about the program and then they'll air it on Instagram the following Monday. We just, we've just we just been doing it this week and we've had over 6,000 views. Um, so when it's, when it's running on um, all the social media you can think of, we do all of that. Um, and then um, we also do email messages from our, we have career coaches in our office that are going by schools. So they will then reach out to the students in the particular majors that we're targeting, even though I know it's all majors, but we have certain majors that we do target. Um, and then just working with Terrell on, um, when she comes on campus, do an info session. So she'll start with Paul and then maybe end up with me. So that's how we work together. Um, and we'll do more work um, with, with Paul being new in his role. We're gonna collaborate more on, on working together. And one last question for you two is mm -hmm. uh, Providence College has sent students for, for many semesters through the pandemic, actually. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had quite a few. Is there any kind of change in the level of support from the administration and the institution for like these off-campus kind of practical experiences that you've noticed? You mean, has it has it dropped as a result of the pandemic? Or increased? I think, or you know, I, the, I, we're, we are lucky that we have a, uh, a president and administration that's really supportive of this program in particular and of study abroad generally. Mm -hmm. So I, I have not noticed a, a shift during the pandemic, which is they really tried, they really tried to push through on everything. Um, so I, you know, that we, we, we have the kind of continued support in terms of how many students we can send and everything else. I also want to add to is I'm the point person for what we call Providence PC and DC. So I use the PC and DC program as a feeder um, for um, this particular program. So right now there are two students here this semester who did PC and DC with me in May. So they're now here, but they also did PC and DC. So that our programs, we have two PC in Hollywood and PC and DC that I'm the, um, the point person and we um, work with our alums um, who roll out the red carpet for us while we're there on the trip. So the one for PC and DC, we're doing, we do it May, the day after graduation. And what I've talked to Terrell about is for this May, maybe do a, a campus tour. Um, so that students will become familiar with the campus and um, and then again uh, uh, increase that awareness. How long? It's um yes, yeah, so it's uh, a week, and um, we've done trips like to the Pentagon, um, Securities Exchange Commission, um, law offices, all places where we have National Association of Broadcasters. We had a phenomenal tour there. So it's every place where we have PC alums. Um, and again, students are, get their foot in the door with me, and then I will push them over to Paul and to Terrell to get their interest. Um, 
and, and just to say one other thing on that note is that we, uh, uh, Providence College has a particularly enthusiastic alumni network that's nice to plug into in any program that is taking place outside of Providence. Mm -hmm. and, and it's worked very well in Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that sometimes the PC alums host the students who are in <laughs> exactly. PC the dinners and thank things you. like that, which yeah. is which yeah. is very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and now we'll turn it over to you, Jennifer. Great, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Rain. I'm the assistant director for internship and course projects at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. Um, we are mostly an undergraduate institution of 2,500 undergrads with a couple of small master's level programs. And we're a transformational liberal arts and sciences college. And we know that experiential learning is at the heart of that transformation. My center is actually the Center for Experiential Learning and Career Success, um, which was born about 10 years ago out of um, a new plan for the university and to kind of have a central point for, you know, service learning, for internships, careers. And uh, we are going into right now a new planning um, era with our new president. And I do feel confident that experiential learning will be a, another major, um, you know, cornerstone of wherever we're heading next. Um, about 75% of our students participate in internships for undergraduate research. Um, that's another hallmark experiential opportunity we have. And about 35 to 40% have a study abroad or study away experience. So we are very committed to helping students connect those dots. So I was asked to kind of talk from the perspective of someone who's working in a career center and sort of my role with you know, promoting this program and connecting um, students with, with the program and also just collaborating on campus. Um, I work closely with our study abroad office so that I'm well versed in the, um, the programs that we have which offer internships because I meet one-on-one -on -one with students every day. Um, and, you know, it's wonderful to be able to tell them, you know, you could go spend a semester in DC doing an internship. And, you know, we have a home tuition model. So they pay the home tuition and then get to come out here for a semester and have a very high quality experience and a high quality internship. Um, so I luckily worked closely with Sabrina and Andre and some of our staff with study abroad. Um, so that I know, you know, what students are doing because they ultimately sign up and, you know, register for the program and everything through the study abroad office um, at our campus. We also have faculty, particularly in um, poli sci, also in international business who are really well versed in this program and encourage students to participate, um, which you all know is huge and a lot of them really learn about it through their faculty as well. Um, and then as far as recruiting students, you know, our study abroad fair every September is a wonderful place for this program to be featured. And um, so that's been a wonderful connecting point. Um, you know, the, the faculty, you know, Jeff came last spring to San Antonio and we had a wonderful lunch with study abroad. Um, we have faculty there as well as us, and it's just all very collaborative and easy um, connections with that. Um, and like I said, I interview or I meet with students searching for internships one on one, which is an excellent place. I also, you know, promote internship programs and things like this through Handshake and email um, to students. And yeah, that's a few of the. Okay. Is it, um, I know you work with Sabrina Cortez, who's here from Study Abroad at Trinity. Um, is it a hard sell uh, to get, and feel free to chime in, Sabrina, um, to get students to consider a domestic program if they're interested in study abroad? Well, I think the ones who come here, you know, it's, it's because it's a natural match for them. You know, they, 
they're not going to be able to have the type of internships in San Antonio, let alone Texas, that they can get out here in DC. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a little bit different, but Sabrina can speak to that too. Yeah, I think Jennifer hit, hit the nail on the head because it's just a particular student who sees himself in Washington, DC. So this is not an actual thing in the We have two students here this semester and they absolutely really immersed in the program and in their internships. Things like that. They're very much goal oriented, and I think that this program really caters to those students. Okay, thank you. Um, Kevin? Hi, right, good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Barrett. I'm a professor of political science at Siena College. I will try to keep this brief, which for a political scientist probably needs 20 to 30 minutes. Um, but you need to cut me off. So, this is my first year at Siena. Uh, this is also my first year working with the Washington semester program, but the program has been integrated at Siena for 30 years. Um, and fortunately for me, stepping into this role this year, my predecessor um, left me set up quite well. What I've learned over the last few months being at Siena is that service learning is integrated into everything that Siena College does. Um, and that comes from the president and the administrators down to faculty, down to staff, to the students. Students expect to have a lot of experiential learning opportunities. It's just the, it's the norm there. Um, where we see that in part, for example, so students at Siena can do up to four classes of internships and earn internship credits for each one of them. So we have a lot of students who can do Washington semester, but also do study abroad. And many of our students do both, um, as well as a lot of other uh, opportunities that are there. So Siena's a Catholic college founded in the Franciscan tradition, which I'm neither uh, Catholic or Franciscan. Um, what that really means is that there's a heavy focus on service. There's a tradition of peace, stewardship, diversity, inclusion, and that's built into everything at Siena. So it makes my job recruiting for this program actually quite easy in some ways um, because students generally become aware of this program in particular fairly early on. And because at Siena, a lot of our courses are interdisciplinary. So we do have, you know, you have your major, so I'm in political science, but a lot of students take poli sci courses who are not political science majors because there's a lot of crossover um, across campus in, in classes. So we develop classes for students to get experience uh, in ways that they wouldn't in some of their major classes or their interests, but it then allows them to, to take classes that would be a bit outside of the norm for them, um, which is a bit. Again, it's a, it's a way where I can talk about this program where they can become aware of this program um, and, and see the opportunities there. Part of it as well is that the administration side of it is integrated in the Washington semester program very easily. So for tuition and financial aid, everything still functions straight through Siena. So students don't have to do anything outside of what they would normally be doing anyway. And the transfer credits back to Siena it's the same thing, it's very seamless. So at the end of the semester, I just enter the grades into the transcripts for the students that um, are taking the courses here with some of the faculty that we met uh, earlier and we'll meet throughout the day. Um, and they're getting that on their transcripts. One other piece that I do wanna bring up that, um, that Terrell asked me to talk about too is that we're in New York, we have a program called the Higher Education Opportunity Program or HEOP as its fun acronym leads to. Um, really quick, HEOP, uh, for students, you have to be a resident of New York. Um, these are students who come from academically underserved backgrounds who have high financial aid needs. Um, so to put it short, these are students who show a lot of promise but would not have opportunities to attend college otherwise. And these students, Siena has about 12 to 15 PIOP students a year that come in. 
Um, and they do a great program there. So they get weekly peer mentoring. So they're set up with a peer who's an older student um, in the HEOP program ahead of them to work with. They also get academic tutoring. They have um, staff, the HEOP staff meets regularly um, for check-ins with the students. A lot of these students tend to be first gen students, so many of them are new. And as we know, first gen students can often struggle, especially in that first year. So the HEOP program builds a support structure and network um, for those students. Um, there's alumni and networking events. The best part of all of this is that the HEOP program covers everything for the Washington semester program. So it'll do it for students for study abroad, but it also covers everything for this program. So any of the additional costs for housing, for travel, the HEOP program will even pay for their, their travel back and forth to Washington, D.C. So it was, it's a great program. My predecessor it integrated the program, uh, the HEOP program with the Washington semester. So we frequently get students from that program who come here and are able to participate in this program um, as well. And, and again, this is one where students come back from doing this program and sell it to all of their friends because Carol does a wonderful visit and her um, on-campus visits are awesome. I can talk to students all day long, but when one of their friends or classmates starts telling them about what they experienced here, that sells it better than anything I can tell them. So uh, it's been uh, really nice and I'm looking forward to continuing the relationship. So. Yeah, thank you for mentioning the HEOPS program. Our, our, uh, the diversity in our program several years ago um, took a little jump. And um, it was interesting to see, you know, the number of students coming from Siena. And uh, uh, your predecessor, Jack Collins, said, you've got to learn about the HEOPS program in New York. And so that's you know, a wonderful program if only every state um, had a HEOPS program yeah. for New York State. Mm -hmm. um, all right, thank you, mm -hmm. Kevin. Um, and now, um, hello, Melissa Davey, there in Poughkeepsie, New York, um, is joining us from Marist College. Hi, hel hello everyone, good morning. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to join you virtually and I'm sorry to miss out on the, the gathering, but you know, we at Marist have really enjoyed the partnership that we've had with the Washington semester program and our students certainly have found it to be very beneficial. And I've been coordinating and serving as the liaison for the last seven years. And, you know, we've had a partnership similar to um, my colleagues from Providence. We've, it's over 30 years. So it's been something that's well established within our institution. And, you know, prior to my um, taking this, we saw that, you know, within political science, we would have a student or two each semester. But it's been interesting in the time that, that I've been here that we've had more kind of focus. So the question about experiential learning and study abroad and internships is certainly a priority here at Marist. We just recently went through our middle states accreditation process and in our high impact practices focus, the Washington semester program was included among the high impact practices as it was bundled with internships and study abroad because both of those things are <laughs> very popular among our students. And we noticed that many students actually bundle these experiences. So they will do Washington maybe in the summer and then go to Florence or London in the in the fall or spring or the reverse. They'll go, you know, so they really want to maximize the opportunities um, that they have. And so we in political science, at least, which I um, teach in political science, our students are able to to really bring in all of the credits from their Washington semester program into both their degree specific degree requirements and their political science elective. So students find it to be very beneficial, um, both from a degree progress standpoint, but also and more importantly, from the connections that they build through their internship experiences. And I would say that the immersive internship is the selling point for our students at Marist. It's a very unique opportunity to be able to spend three days a week in a in a very professional setting working alongside public servants of all of all varieties. And students have been able to leverage that experience. Um, I have a student, um, I'm very pleased to say that she was in the program 
and she, you know, was there last spring. She continued with an internship in the summer, and she has the network that she built starting in her Washington semester program has yielded full-time job opportunities that she'll begin in January. So she was very focused, very motivated, and really was able to leverage every part of her experience. Um, so, and that's not, you know, I'm certain we all can think of those students who have been extra motivated, but, you know, I think that the program and the way it's set up is really allow students to take advantage of that. And one of the things that Terrell wanted me to speak about, which was something that we started before the pandemic and then the pandemic put it um, on pause, but we brought it back last, um, last spring, is a sort of short-term spring break trek. So similar to the PC in DC, but it's a three-day alumni-centered um, panel discussion. So we have alums, we have a very vibrant alumni um, network in DC. And my dean, who's very supportive of this program, assembled various panels from lots of different disciplines and, and sectors within DC to come and talk to students about just what it's like to work in DC and what they did at Marist and to help them build those kind of connections about what they did, you know, the shared, um, the shared um, experiences of particular professors or classes or even, you know, working in our or being a part of our student theater group. So it was a really nice way for students who aren't in political science, which I think this past trip, we really saw a broad um, cross section of campus who went to DC in March and expressed interest in going. So it wasn't just political science and we're seeing a growing um, interest among business students because of the particular you know, courses and the accredited, accred the, the program helps our business students meet their <laughs> degree requirements and that's very attractive. So I'm noticing an increase and so students are making those kind of connections. So it's been very popular. Um, we've certainly been very fortunate to capitalize on the opportunities that Terrell brings to us when she visits our campus and our students and alumni are very motivated to continue to have um, you know, a growing network of supporters. Thank you, Melissa. I think it's very interesting that um, schools that tend to use the program as a focal point, um, the students in DC as a focal point um, are able to bring in alumni through that way in a way that they might not be able to to you know, direct advertising or marketing, like or even a Facebook group. A lot of alumni associations have a Facebook group, like let's get together. But um, for some schools, the students do seem to provide that uh, reason to rally alumni around. Um, and so that's what I observed coming to your event last year and uh, seeing those panels. So, thank you. Um, all right, and we'll turn to Lydia um, next, and then we'll open the floor for questions for any of them. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lydia Malone. I am the Director for Leadership and Public Service at Mount Holyoke College. I can talk louder if we need to. Um, I use she, they pronouns. And like some of my colleagues here, I am also in my first year in this role. Um, I helped in the role last year in an interim capacity, and Carol was very, very helpful to me uh, as I sort of acclimatized myself to the program. Uh, Mount Holyoke has partnered with the Washington Semester Program since 2019. Our first year was the pandemic year. Mm -hmm. um, and really, it was an exceptional remote experience for our students. Uh, our institution has always really stressed the transformative power of a liberal arts education and experiential learning. And it's really something that's embedded purposefully in our curriculum and throughout every stage of our students' time on campus. When Frances Perkins was a student, she visited the textile mills in Polio. Um, and that was, you know, we can't say for certain that that was central to her experiences later in labor, but one could assume. Uh, we uh, have a variety of other innovations on campus that support study abroad and that support experiential learning. All of our students have access to a guaranteed $3,000 for internship funding. That can be used domestically, it can be used abroad. There are some curricular requirements that accompany that, but we are you know, really always looking for ways where we can connect across campus broadly with our students. 
And this program is a really exceptional fit for us. Uh, in the Center for Leadership, we partner closely with Free Law, with our Career Center, and I have a co-director of this program, Professor Adam Hilton, who is in our politics department. <laughs> our program is a little unique uh, in that we have, so we have six students here right now, our DC six. Students that are selected for our center makes them sound like they're like a hit squad. <laughs> students that are selected for our program um, we, we interview and meet with them in-house and they meet with myself, they meet with Professor Hilton, um, we talk with a faculty reference for them and during their time here they do all of the great AU programming, site visits, courses, and an internship and they are all also assigned an alumni mentor from Mount Holyoke. Washington is our largest alum network and they are an active group. So each student is paired one-on-one -on -one with an alum mentor. Um, ideally, it's someone that's in their field of interest. They meet with them. They are able to often do a site visit for the whole cohort at the alum mentor's places of employment. There's also a lot of uh, opportunities through the larger alumni body for informal networking and connection. This year, one of our students is interning with the ACLU and their mentor is the director of civil rights at the Department of Labor. Um, great match. All six of our students were able to do a special site visit to the Department of Labor where they were able to see the Francis Perkins exhibit. It really came full circle this year. It's not always that perfect. Um, and our students all do a four credit independent study with our faculty director. Uh, that's done remotely, and it ends up being a substantial paper that they do is often rooted in the work that they're doing at their internship or in something here that relates to their studies at Mount Holyoke that sort of lights a spark for them. We've seen that transition into a senior thesis for several students. Others will participate in our big sort of senior conference uh, presentations that we do at the end of the year. And many of our students have returned to DC after graduation and are now working here on the Hill um, in think tanks in a variety of places. The ability to sort of build the bridge between our alums and our current students is really helpful for our students' learning experience, but also for attracting students to the program. Um, much like you, we have a MHC in DC program, Liz, like PC in DC, where we bring a group of juniors and seniors in the spring and do alumni site visits. We'll have a panel, our alumni network hosts us. And that's a really great opportunity as well to promote this program and for folks to connect and learn about the opportunities here. We also have a home tuition model. Um, and so everything uh, sort of comes the same over. And that's really allowed us to be very equitable with the students that we're able to attract and to attend. We've had a couple of students that are posse scholars. I don't know if anyone else is a posse institution. Um, and we've really increased our number of FGLI students that are able to participate for generation low income in this program. And it is always really meaningful when we're also able to pair a student with an alum mentor with an FGLI background. I think that that provides sort of an additional level of wraparound that we can't always provide not here on the ground. That's a little bit about how we do things. <laughs> Um, can you talk about more about Professor Hilton's role and his uh, duties yes. that a professor who's teaching? To be clear, the students from Mount Holyoke are enrolled in our in Washington semester part time, and the the remaining credit hours are taught by their professor from Mount Holyoke, who comes several times per semester. Yes, so they do three courses here, um, and then one with Professor Hilton. They meet weekly remotely with Professor Hilton on Zoom. Um, and they have sort of a shared course that they're all doing as well as their independent research project. Professor Hilton comes once a month, sometimes twice a month, meets with the students here, and then they will go on an additional site visit, um, sort of supplemental to the AU site visits. And those are often rooted in an alumni mentor connection, but not every time. Sometimes it works out. 
that um, I know we did the Library of Congress last fall and um, Adam had a connection there from his own research that he's doing and we were able to do a site visit there and that was exciting for the students. Um, we get a real diversity of majors. So initially, because we're in our Center for Leadership, certainly the sort of students that we're self-selecting were our students in politics on IR, but we've had a real increase in uh, data science students and environmental science students. We've had a few that are French majors. Um, so I think also having Professor Hilton, though he is rooted in our politics department, on the curricular side and the faculty side, helping with marketing and recruitment has really helped to expand the students that we're reaching. Thank you. All right, we have a few minutes left for questions for any of our panelists, including uh, Melissa. Please. Yes. So, uh, first of all, really thank you for uh, sharing that how you leverage the program to achieve the uh, dispersal learning goals you set up for your students. And I feel personally, I learned a lot of pretty practice from all of you that uh, we can we can borrow and learn and implement to further enhance the experimental learning for our own students here. Um, my question is about you know for watching this semester program and many, many other experimental learning programs, there's that as a two component: academic seminars versus internships. You, you need to strike the right balance between. The, the hours inside classrooms and the, the learning outside classrooms. We have heard from time to time from student feedback. The, and also we, this is the observation to the industry trend that uh, the internship hours became longer and longer and the, the seminar uh, somehow has been reduced. So uh, my question would be, uh, what would be the right balance between the academic work, the academic seminars and the internship when the students going abroad, either going abroad or study away, going semester long, away from the campus. What would be the ideal balance uh, you, you are looking for your students? I, I mean, to me, the balance should be, I, I, I mean, I, I like the, the, the reports that I get back from students, I like the balance that I'm seeing here. And for two reasons. One, I, I, I think the balance should be in favor of experiential learning over classroom learning. Uh, if you're gonna be away, I think you should be taking advantage of the place where you are. Um, it's also sounds to me like, and from the earlier presentations, that the, that the professors are not just having you read something and then you come in and have a lecture about it, right? They're bringing in uh, experts, they're they're doing class classrooms on at some you know location around DC that is is kind of meaningful to the to the conversation. So um, from from my perspective, that's the right balance. And I, I don't know if you mean between how much work uh, you know if you're working three days or two days, I'm not sure about that, but I do like the uh, the idea of kind of ex more experience, uh, less traditional classroom learning in this in, in, when you're away. Thank you, Melissa. Well, I think that's an, an important question. And when I'm meeting, because we also do a, an internal application process, and part of our process is making sure that students are ready for a very independent, active because it's not the same kind of experience. Um, and so they have to be ready for the kind of intensity that both the internship and the seminars bring. So we do emphasize that it's not a traditional arrangement. It's not the same kind of study abroad experience where you just have classes and, and that a class one week may be very different in terms of both the hours and the content than other, than other classes. So we've had to be very, specific in making sure students were prepared for what would feel like a more intense schedule, that it, it really does feel like it's a full-time commitment. And so in terms of the experience, we really do emphasize the experience and that it's, you can't do anything else. <laughs> you know, you're really there in DC in these, in these three, you know, various, you know, the two seminars plus the internship. So, um, 
and we do allow credit for that experience and those hours that are spent. Anyone else? I mean, I agree. I think that the balance should be on the experiential side of things, but I think that AU does such a good job, as we saw with the faculty, in threading that piece through the academic and course time. And I also think that there's, you know, that like intangible third piece that's not the internship and not the coursework, but it's living on your own. It's maybe cooking your own food and it's having that side of the experiential learning yeah. the, that, um, it's important to hold time for. And I think that the balance right now um, is really good based on what we hear in terms of feedback regarding students having the time to also just sort of live and immerse themselves in the environment that they're in. That reminds me of the student uh, when I visited Mount Holyoke last year who uh, came up to me and handed me a sheet and she said, these are life hacks. <laughs> for uh, for students living on their own at TC, and the first uh, the first bullet point was all the delivers groceries. <laughs> we have built that into our onboarding. That we're like, here are some grocery resources. All the <laughs> delivery, yeah. Yes, I have a question. Thank you all so much. And this is a question for for you all, but also you all. Um, as the academic, I'm oh, sorry, the internship advisors, um, we try to do as much as we can to help the students in terms of onboarding. And so for me, that means running professional development workshops, I did like, you know, networking and, um, and how to, you know, in interviewing and LinkedIn and just finding an internship. And for Meg, it, in addition to being one on one with the students, and for Meg, it's like getting together these really terrific, um, panels um, or presentations from employers like EPA among many others. But is there anything specific that you feel like that you hear from your students that we could do more of or that you would like to see more of? I mean, because really what we do should be driven by you all. So I'd love to hear it. And I know this is a big question, we're running short of time, so it doesn't have to be right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in because um, I, I think you, you all do a fantastic job. And again, while being new, I just seeing like those on. I always approach this from that perspective that students are that they don't have anything to at the start. So as you were talking about, so um, helping them learn how to network. What does that mean? How to do that? Um, in those kinds of things, even to the point of what do they need to wear, right? Clothing wise, how can they be prepared in that sense? Because they're coming from a place where, you know, they roll into class and sweatpants and, you know, a t shirt, and that's fine. But, you know, what it means to be in a professional capacity, both for, through the internship, but then also, um, you know, how Washington works. So those kinds of just basic skill building um, uh, programs, workshops, support, um, I, I think is, is necessary and fantastic. I mean, you do a good job with that. So we try to prepare our students as much as possible just to give them a sense, but it's really not until they're interacting with you all and then get here that they I think, fully understand what the program means and what they're, like, what they're about to experience. And if you have ideas later, you know, you can uh, send them to us and we can make sure that Karen and Meg um, get, get those. Mm -hmm. um, yes, one of the things I wanted to share is through working with students. I also heard it from the students because they are living for many of them the first time in a department. Mm -hmm. And even though they're walking distance to grocery stores, students are actually going even further than that. They're subscribing to food delivery. Mm -hmm. um, pre-prepared food delivery and groceries. And there's a couple of local ones, like there's Too Good To Go, which is basically restaurant food that would be thrown away at the end of the day. Um, and that was really interesting to me, like talking to them and, and hearing them and seeing that they do the food subscriptions. And many of them also look like HelloFresh and Blue Apron and, and things like that. Um, there's also the rounds, which in DC is like a sustainable way to get groceries. They pick up the containers um, at the end of the week. 
and they refill them instead of um, just kind of producing and throwing away or recycling. So it's interesting how innovative they themselves are. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely something we're gonna help promote as well at orientation moving on from spring is basically food resources. Um, because for me, it was a surprise that they were subscribing <laughs> to food care. I'm thinking they're gonna learn how to cook. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I mean, with the world the way it is, we're all kind of shopping and supplementing from like Trader Joe's pre-prepared food or whole foods or hot bars and cold bars and food to go. So they're kind of ahead of us in the sense that they're doing these subscriptions. So we'll definitely um, incorporate that into our orientation. Okay. Well, we're running just a couple of minutes over now, um, but I'd like to say thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Next up, we will introduce our next round of faculty who I see are here. Um, please feel free, as I said, if you need a break, take a break, get something to drink, use the restroom. We will like uh, uh, be bringing the faculty up in one minute. And, and if you're looking what? for a talk yeah, you just have a right? reply, so yeah. you can have a yeah. group to sit Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, Okay. There's a there's a there's a link there in the department. I think it's all I think there's I think it's a good one. If you want to do the response to the fellow, I think I worry that it's not my I'm going to get out of my system. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, 
Um, it will be you, Susie, Susie, and then Jack. Yes. All right. So, and I should be coming this way. Yes. Okay, everyone, ready to start. Um, I'm really happy to introduce um, Dr. Niebuhr, um to talk to you about his course. Great. I, I realize we have, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Mohammed Nimmer. I realize we have only half an hour, and I, I think my colleagues have probably have more to say than I do. Uh, I have the easiest job uh, among the three uh, of us. Uh, uh, I teach this internship course, if you can call it teaching. So my role <laughs> is actually academic supervision and uh, facilitation. Uh, so the, the, I help students right from the uh, from the start uh, with their uh, internship application material. Uh, I look at it. Most of what I looked at this semester actually was after the fact that they have gotten uh, placements. Uh, but I, I I impress on my students that. Uh, this is uh, this is for the future. This is not just for uh, for this uh, internship. Uh, I uh, would like to help you get to a point where you have a flawless uh, uh, resume and um, uh, internship application uh, letter. And uh, I do a, I find a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things to uh, to share with students. Uh, how to write a resume, uh, even uh, things from um, uh, from technical uh, to uh, to things to just make all the presentation parallel, uh, to make the, uh, the the resume parallel with the uh, with how the student uh, introduces themselves in the uh, application letter, uh, uh, and so uh, I think they've been very pleased with the feedback uh, uh, they're getting from. Me. Uh, uh, then I asked them to write an introspective paper, a, a paper that uh, they can use uh, to market themselves uh, for uh, for future job applications. Uh, and I I, uh, I advise them to uh, uh, to think clearly uh, and 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 critically about their own strengths, their own weaknesses, and uh, what they plan uh, uh, to do about it. Given uh, their career objective. Even having a career objective, but sometimes uh, some of our students are still struggling with that. Uh, some of them know exactly what they want to be after they graduate. Uh, a good number of them, they still don't know. And so they're experimenting. Uh, and, and I tell them, that's fine. You still have time. Uh, just learn from this uh, internship uh, uh, what, what you like, what you dislike. Uh, what that means for uh, what uh, what uh, you could plan for the future, and I think we've been having uh, uh, good exchanges. Uh, then I uh, uh, then I have them write a mid semester evaluation after like uh, seven eight weeks of uh, work uh, in an internship. Uh, what did you learn from it? How how is that uh, opening up uh, career uh, thinking for you? Uh, where where are you going with this? What, what 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 did you discover? You still need to work on. Those are the sorts of things I ask students to uh, uh, to write. And sometimes share. Sometimes in in our class meetings because we don't meet every week. We meet every uh, two three weeks. Uh, so I ask them to come uh, volunteer, sharing their own experience, their own thinking, and then exchanging uh, uh, ideas and thoughts with their uh, with their colleagues. Uh, next week we're going to have a uh, we're going to have a speaker uh, who spent a life career in in, in different uh, roles in uh, in uh, in NGOs in, uh, uh, in in government in academia uh, and, and they will talk to her about how uh, how she uh, how she managed to market herself how she managed to and and what she did to go. To move from one field, one industry to uh, to another, because some of them uh, are thinking about uh, uh, their their uh, their qualifications uh, growing up as teenagers and, and 
getting involved in different jobs and then their education and thinking about their future, these things might not be the same. And so how, how are you gonna move uh, from uh, having years uh, spent in being a lifeguard uh, to thinking about uh, becoming a, a lobbyist or, or a lawyer? Uh, uh, so hopefully uh, they'll get some, uh, uh, some tips uh, from, the, um, uh, from our speaker uh, on, on how to do that and how uh, she actually uh, did that uh, throughout her career. So that's, that's the internship course. This is it. <laughs> right. Any questions? Sorry, I may have missed it, but how many times a week do we meet? Uh, uh, we meet every uh, two to three weeks. Okay. Yeah. Yes. What is the advantage of the uh, internship opportunity uh, among the government, uh, international institution, and also outside? Well, this is DC, it has everything, right? Yeah, right. That's yeah. The bad, that's yeah. Right. Uh, you mean in terms of the internships that our students have uh, have gotten? Um, that's a good question. Most of our students are in uh, in, in, in government, I mean, uh, this batch of students, in government uh, uh, type uh, positions. Uh, many are in Congress, uh, they're interns in congressional offices. Uh, some in uh, 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 key uh, government agencies, uh, but uh, nearly half are in um, working with NGOs. Right? I would confirm that indeed. Um, um, writ large in the entire Washington semester program, I would say the ratio would be um, indeed over half. In government, and that would fall into several categories, of course, of being on the Hill is most popular for our students. And then following that, we, we do have a number of federal executive agencies that students are also interning for, and we have very strong connections with the Department of Commerce, Treasury, um, and several, several others, including EPA. Um, so if you check out our website, you'll get a little bit of a taste. Our students get direct access to 4,000 employers. And, and the, those employers do represent largely um, the government is a big share, but following that, nonprofits are also popular, including also NGOs. Um, we also do have some private sectors with industry and business. We don't hear more about this diversity on the panel coming up after lunch. Um, but overall, I would say part of the, um, the excitement and the relevance of internships comes from that um, students in meeting um, with our support, their searches to figure out what they want to do. So really they decide to limit, they can find their dream and they get a lot of support on the AU side from Karen, Meg and myself um, and our systems and resources of course the faculty as well as front and center in the regular meeting time and especially over the course of the term. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Susie Erin Rich. I hope you accept my apologies. I was a dancer for 32 years, so I can't think and stand still at the same time. I'm a little bit of a pacer. So I want to start with a little exercise to see where you all stand and for you to think about where your students stand. How many of you get your information from TikTok? <laughs> How many of you think that your students get a lot of their information from TikTok? <laughs> How many of you get some of your information from Facebook? <laughs> How many of you think that your students get their information from Facebook? Yeah. <laughs> That's old hat. That's for the older folks, the social security folks, I think. Okay. How many of you get your information from National Public Radio? How many of you think your students tune into National Public Radio? <laughs> How many of you get your information from MSNBC? How many of you think your students ever turn on the channel? 
How can you get your information from Fox? Oops. How can you? <laughs> how many of you think some of your students get information from Fox? <laughs> Last, how many of you get your information from CNN? How many of you think some of your students get information from CNN? So I teach national conversations in times of crisis. I've been affiliated with the Washington Semester Program for about 10 years, but actually it goes way back because Gary Weaver, who is the guru of, he was the guru, sadly he passed away, of intercultural understanding and cross-cultural communication, was actually heading the program before it came to SPECS and now OGIS. So I look at the classroom as the whole Washington DC metropolitan area. And what I try to do is I expose students to conversations that they're probably not having. So I take them out of the mainstream and we have all of Washington as a playground. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time and please cut me off when my time is over, talking about some of the guest speakers that I have and some of the site visits that we go on. Because the purpose is to expand their horizons so that they're making memories and maybe they can reflect back on this experience that they've had in DC. I've been affiliated with the DC area for about 40 years. So um, worked in nonprofits, did a lot of different things. So I have a lot of connections with a lot of different people. So a couple weeks ago, we had Betty Siegel. Have any of you ever heard of Betty Siegel? Betty Siegel is an attorney by trade. She's the director of accessibility at the Kennedy Center. She comes to speak to the students about disability rights or human rights. And what she does is she expands the horizons as far as what does it mean to have a disability? A lot of people think that just having a wheelchair or having a cane, they don't necessarily think about hearing loss or eyesight loss. And she comes and she does simulations with the students. And by the time she's done, she's actually one of the class favorites. They go away with a whole different perspective. She actually takes them back to the DC Dis Disabilities Movement. Judy Human, she talked about who recently passed away. Judy Human actually was my neighbor. Judy Human, in a wheelchair with her husband, um, was on the front lines of the disability rights movement here in Washington, DC, which got a lot of bills passed and acknowledgement for the disability rights movement. So that's one example. I took them to meet with Frank Smith. Have any of you ever heard of Frank Smith? Frank Smith was in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. A whole generation of the civil rights movement is passing away. Frank Smith is 81 years old. He's a brilliant architect, not architect meaning strategist, tactician. He served five years in one of the most dangerous parts of this country during the movement in Mississippi. Later on, he became a DC councilman. And then he went to earn his PhD and was responsible for getting the African-American Civil War Memorial built in DC. And during that inauguration, some of Michelle Obama's relatives came to that inauguration and they said, you gotta do more. Just having the names of deceased soldiers on the memorial, which happens to be beautiful at the U Street corridor, isn't enough. So they built a museum and now they're expanding. So it was an inclement day and Frank came out and his enactor, Civil War enactor came out 
and we had a conversation with the students about his former life in SNCC, as well as the memorial, gave the history. And then he took the students into the new renovated space that is open to nobody yet. And he took them into different rooms to talk about the renovated museum that's going to be opening this spring, hopefully. Another person they were exposed to is Jerry Mitchell. How many of you are familiar with Jerry Mitchell? He's the author of Race Against Time. Jerry Mitchell is an award-winning journalist. Jerry Mitchell won the Genius Award through the MacArthur Foundation. Those of you not familiar with the MacArthur Foundation or the Genius Awards, he gave $500,000. He worked at the Clearing Ledger for 30 years. Two individuals divided by two years in order to do the work. Jerry Mitchell is known among certain groups of people for his investigative reporting was responsible for reopening cold cases and landing Klansmen in jail, and they died in jail. So he comes through Zoom, um, which he wasn't able to do in the past from Mississippi, to talk about his experience, the death threats that he received. The first cold case that he worked on was Byron D. Lynn Beckwith, the murder of Medgar Evers on June 12, 1963. Two cases, nobody arrested. The third case, he partnered with Merle Evers, the widow of Medgar Evers. Ended up, she actually held on to all the transcripts of the files. And Jerry dug deep and dug deep and he actually went and he interviewed Byron D. Beckwith. He said to the students, if you ever thought you needed a shower, it was after I had that conversation. I don't think that Byron D. Beckwith really knew who he was, but during the trial, he realized that he was the one stirring up all the commotion. And he looked over in the courtroom at Jerry and said, see that when he dies, he is going to Africa. And Jerry said, always wanted to go to Africa. And he has. <laughs> so those are kind of some of the experiences. I also partnered with the Holocaust Museum for about six or seven years. They had an important project going on called History Unfolded. What did Americans know between 1933 and 1945 when the Holocaust was happening? Students had an opportunity to dig deep into the paper archives. Some on microphone, microfiche um, of what was happening here and then the territories where people were exposed to. Over a thousand entries from students at American University in these classrooms contributed. And some of them, some of their contributions were so good that they ended up in the traveling exhibit, which is still happening today. Next week, I have somebody coming to talk about the Night of Terror. Anybody know what the Night of Terror was during the women's suffrage movement? Alice Powell, a suffragette, has a house here in DC, Belmont House. Fortunately, it's under reconstruction. So somebody from the National Park Service is coming to talk to the students. So they get exposed to all these different conversations. A couple of weeks before that, I had somebody from the trans community come to tell their story, how it felt to be trans, talked about how the parents disowned that for being trans. So that students have an opportunity, I call them courageous conversations. That is actually not my term. I stole it from Mary Clark. She used to be here. Um, they get to engage them with each other. First, we spend time building up the community. 
so that it is a safe space. When they come into the classroom, they have to first read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that's what I think of my classroom is needed for a safe space for everybody to have a conversation. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions before I turn it off to my esteemed colleague, who was actually my mentor when I first started teaching in the conference. So anybody have any questions? No? Okay. Thank you. It's not quite. 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 It's Okay, cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Crouch. I uh, am in my 19th year here at Washington, and uh, I'm the American politics guy. I kind of have my foot in the uh, legal world as well. Um, I want to start out by just kind of talking about what my classes did this week, because it kind of gives you a sense of like what a typical week looks like. Um, I teach the seminar right now in Washington semester called U.S. Presidency, and I teach another course, another program called Presidential Scandals. And uh, the scandals, uh, as you would imagine, are pretty interesting to try to focus on Watergate, Iran-Contra, Clinton, Lewinsky, and Trump. And uh, the, the course is kind of you know, divided into those four scandals. And uh, around midterms, right, where the students are kind of getting tired of the sound of my voice, I'm having guest yes speakers. And uh, some of them come in, in, per in person, some of them come in over Zoom. This week, I had a guest speaker come in on Monday named David Mark. David Mark's the uh, Washington Examiner's uh, magazine's managing editor. And he also spoke to my Washington semester class. For that class, we actually went to him and went downtown. We went into the Washington Examiner's building. He showed us you know, where the news happens, all the desks in their you know, little area where they um, film. They do like a podcast. And uh, so he did a great job. I asked him to come in and talk to my presidential students class this week. And so he came in and talked about what's in the news, media fragmentation, and polarization, and all those different things that have impacted the news and how it's perceived today and how it's impacted American politics. So that was Monday. Uh, my seminar I met on Tuesday, my Washington semester seminar. And for that particular class, we were talking about the federal budget. And uh, there's an organization called the Concord Coalition based in DC, founded by a Democrat, a Republican, nonpartisan. And uh, what they do is they try to educate members of Congress, you know, people that have you know, position of power in DC, students, whomever, about the federal budget. And uh, their uh, constituent person is actually based in Georgia rather than DC. And he comes to DC to do this exercise in person. They have, um, an exercise called Principles and Priorities. And what it is, is basically their people at the Concord Coalition create a sample budget. And they have an options book that has pros and cons on a bunch of different issues, whether they should be funded or not. And they have a workbook that has a bunch of numbers in it about like, should this be funded or should this not be funded? And how does it affect the bottom line, depending on what your group decides? And it's basically a simulation where the students are members of Congress, they have a constituency, and they're given this you know, big packet of all these different numbers, and they have to make all these different decisions as a group. So it's a simulation where they're voting, you know, they're making the case for one side or the other, and it's being supervised by uh, this expert on these simulations. And you know, it's one thing to say, oh, well, you know, the federal budget, they spend a bunch of money on social programs and the military, whatever. It's a very different thing when you're role-playing the role of the person that has to decide what are we going to fund, what are we not going to fund. You know, how do we come to a consensus on these things when I have a constituency that I want to reelect me, but at the same time, we've got a vote in this group and other people are in the same position I am, what do we do? And so it's like a two hour simulation and they come out of it going, gee, you know, that was really uh, hard. And, you know, inevitably what happens is the, the, the budget so far in the whole that even if they make drastic cuts and they're still adding to the overall debt, uh, which is a little sobering, but you know, again, 
It's one thing to read it about it, read about it in a book. It's another thing to be sitting in that seat thinking about how do I balance my need to get reelected and fund a bunch of stuff with how do we get a little bit closer to not having these deficits year after year and how do we do that? So that was Tuesday. And then in my uh, presidential scandals class on Thursday, another guest speaker, we read as one of our core books a book called The Watergate Girl. And this is a memoir written by Jill Weinbanks, formerly known as Jill Bulmer. And uh, she was one of the prosecutors in the Watergate case. And she talked about you know, cross-examining Rosemary Wood and talking about like, you know, the case developing in front of her and uh, you know, all of the different sort of maneuverings on the legal side of the Watergate case. It would have been easy to just say, let's just read all the president's pen. But from her book, we got her perspective. We also got you know, her take on being a woman in the professional world 50 years ago. What was it like? Well, there was sexism. You know, there was people that treated her kind of paternalistically. And it, 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 I assign it over and over again. The students love this book. She joined us on Thursday from Chicago via Zoom to talk about her book, to answer speaker questions. And uh, I note this, I know this isn't my Washington semester class, but I note this because it's an example of how Zoom has kind of opened up a new world for us. You know, we still go downtown, we still have meetings. We still invite speakers to campus. We still talk with them about you know, what's going on in their organizations. But if for whatever reason we can't connect, if we can't go there, if they can't come to us, Zoom is always an option. And so it creates this opportunity for students to meet people that otherwise they wouldn't have an opportunity to meet. And um, you know, during the pandemic, when we're trying to figure out you know, how do we have speakers and how do we do kind of what we normally do in a circumstance where we can't be face-to-face. Zoom really opened a lot of doors. And I continue to use Zoom when I need to. It's not my first choice, but like when the option is, you know, you can't do it in person in, on campus, you can't go down to them. You know, what do you do? Well, you connect over Zoom. Um, so that's kind of a typical week uh, for me. As I mentioned, I, I teach this course, the seminar course in Washington semester called uh, the US Presidency. Uh, I'm kind of a presidency guy. I'm. Uh, I've taught different flavors of this. I mentioned presidential scandals. I teach an elective course in the Washington Semester Program called uh, the U.S. Presidency History and Current Controversies, which is an evening elective, and it's uh, a different approach. My presidency seminar is very much focused on like the contemporary presidency, and so we use a textbook that arranges things by the presidency and something else, right? So it's the presidency and the legislature, the presidency and the courts, the presidency and uh, the media, or whatever the case may be, which then kind of opens doors to like site visits and speakers. It's pretty straightforward to do it that way. The elective course that I teach is chronological. It literally starts with George Washington. It works all the way up to Joe Biden. And it's supplemented by a book called Debating the Presidency, which takes political issues and it has a scholar on each side of them. And so, you know, when it comes to uh, the pardon power, for example, like, do we need to reform the Constitution to change the party power? One scholar is going to argue yes, another scholar is going to argue no, and so the students are going to get the best of both arguments that way. Um, so that's the, the presidency elective course that I, I teach in Washington, uh, Washington semester. Before the pandemic, uh, I taught a course called Political Institutions, and Political Institutions, the seminar, is kind of the same idea as the U.S. presidency. You have a bunch of different DC-based uh, organizations that you try to get in touch with. So we'll do a capital tour. We'll go to the U.S. Supreme Court and get a, a tour. You know, we'll do the, the public White House tour. We'll have someone from an interest group come in. We'll have someone from the media come in. And um, that's political institutions. That's something that's kind of been uh, put away for a couple of years during the pandemic, but it's gonna uh, come back. Another seminar that I do was called um, Political Transitions. Uh, it's kind of like Professor Sharon's course, only a little bit of a different approach. Mine's more of like a, a straight up public policy course, and I'm going to be teaching that this spring uh, as a uh, elective. So it's not going to be a seminar, it's going to be an, an even elect, elective along with uh, revitalized uh, U.S. political institutions. Um, I'm planning, if all goes well, in fall of 2024 to teach a new elective called presidential elections. It's not, it's not 100%, I shouldn't say that. I taught it eight years ago. And I taught it as an evening elective. And uh, of course, this was Trump versus Clinton. And uh, 
you know, the students kind of came back shell shocked after that result. Uh, but they learned a lot about the process leading up to it. Uh, so I'm going to teach a new version of that that's going to, of course, coincide with uh, 2024. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, we like to stay in touch with our alums. <clears throat> in a few minutes, I'm going to introduce one of my former students who's going to speak about uh, his experiences. Another recent alum that has come back to the program, former member of Congress, Ryan Costello. He uh, is a Washington alum, and he was a uh, congressman in Pennsylvania. Uh, a few years ago, he got redistricted out. Um, he makes the trip in to talk to my classes and uh, kind of share his wisdom that way. Um, I'm trying to think what else I can tell you. I mean, a lot of my experiences really kind of coincide with what my uh, my my fellow uh, scholars have talked about. So Adam Sharon talked about his experience doing the Washington Semester Program. I myself did a Washington Semester Program. It wasn't through AU, but it was kind of the same idea. It was like a sophomore in college. Uh, I came out here and I did a three-week uh, term in May. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. And then the next year I came back for a full semester, my junior year. And that was kind of it for me. I took a little bit of a detour, went through law school, came back down here into graduate school, and I've uh, been here ever since. Um, I teach an internship class and do a lot of the same things that Professor Niever does in terms of you know, offering students different opportunities that they didn't know were there before. One of the things that I like to do, I think I mentioned that I kind of do American politics and law. Um, I kind of go back and forth. Sometimes I'll supervise the American politics internships. Sometimes I'll, I'll supervise the law internships. Um, but no matter what, whatever class I'm, I'm supervising, I always do a class on law in graduate school. And at this point, I've got probably about two dozen or so articles, just like trends in legal hiring, like uh, law school rankings, LSAT scores, the impact of the pandemic on legal hiring, et cetera. And I'll just kind of you know, have a class where I'll talk through all these articles and I'll say to the students, look, you know, I'm going to give you both sides of this. You know, I've been through the, the legal education side of things. I have my own opinions, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Uh, what I am going to say is, here's the things that you need to be thinking about if you want to go to law school. And, you know, it comes down to your individual situation, your finances, your interests, what you want to do after you get out, et cetera. And so I think that's one of the, the best takeaway courses, uh, or best takeaway classes that I offer in the internship course. Um, I think that's all I have. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah, sure. I told you this at the beginning of your um, yeah, sure. this conversation about the internship course that I talked yeah. to. Yeah. Is that tip for the internship course? Do they write a paper about their experience? What is the best? Yeah, so the assessments, I mean, we kind of have like a, a group of different assessments that faculty kind of pick and choose from. Um, generally, everybody asks the students to do a journal. And the journals are usually about like two pages a week, just kind of like start out with your, your internship experience. And then if you, you know, hurting from material, branch out to like what's going on in your classes. And usually that's, that gets it done. Um, so there's that that kind of tracks what they're doing throughout the course of the semester. Uh, sometimes I'll sign a paper at the very beginning. So they just kind of like, they're starting their internship search and they're thinking about like, okay, well, here's where I think this is going to go. Here's what I think I'm interested in. Here's the places I'm applying. And so then by the end of the semester, they kind of look back and go, oh boy, that either that was a lot like I thought it was going to be, or that was nothing like I thought it was going to be. So there's the, the initial assessment, there's the journal, which they do as they're going throughout things. And uh, I also assign a presentation at the end. So they put together you know, five or six PowerPoint slides. And I ask them to answer the same questions, basically. Where, where did you go? What did you do? What was the best thing? What was the, the worst thing? And what did you learn? Like, you know, how are you different now at the end of the semester than you were at the very beginning? And, you know, you see some really interesting things. There's, there's celebrity encounters, there's, you know, story, all kinds of stories. Um, and they're very frank about <laughs> the things they experience. And it's, you know, it's great because I tell them, you know, now you're reflecting back on this. So you've looked forward, you've experienced it as you've gone, and now you're looking back. And I tell them, you know, it makes sense to put some time and effort into those journals because five, 10 years from now, you're going to want to look at that and remember like what you were doing at that time, what you were thinking at that time. Another thing I tell them, and I'm sure like Carl was uh, advising as well, as they're going through the semester, they should keep in a Google Doc. What are you working on? Who are you doing it for? How long did it take you to do it? What's your feedback? And so by the end of the semester, they've got you know, their entire semester encapsulated already. 
And so when it comes to go to the supervisor and ask for a recommendation letter, it's as simple as like, here's the link to everything that I've been doing this semester. They could even offer to write a draft of it if they wanted to, and but that's what they're drawing from me the case. And so they keep that that document again, look back in five or ten years. You know, what was that person's name that I networked with? How do you know where was their phone number? Where was their email address? So um, and you know, Amy and, and the other folks have talked a lot about like establishing a LinkedIn account and so forth. Um, you know, we try to, to make it as easy but as productive as possible to stay in touch with people going forward. Uh, and one of the things I always tell them is, look, you know, we may not feel like it right now, but your first level of um, people that you're going to be networking, networking with is in this classroom, right? You see each other all the time, you go to lunch with them, you go to your internship with them, but like in five years, you want to be connected to all these people first, you know, and then everybody else you know, kind of comes second, but like you got your family, you got your friends, you got your homeschool, you got your, your Washington folks, and you should stay in touch with all of them. You know, because things are going to change very quickly, right? Like you're used to doing things for four months. You have your routine, you have your internship, you have your friends. And then, you know, come December, fifth, or whatever, everything stops and it can be a little jarring. So if you're just kind of laying the groundwork while you're going, you know, you'll, you'll have all those people connected anyway. And I'm sure they have other things we, we recommend like them, but I'm sure they're connected on my gas and everything else. So anyway, more than you wanted to know. But no. <laughs> thank you. We also take into consideration the evaluation of their work supervisors. Right. And that's a good part of their uh, grade. Right. Yeah. One of the things Amy uh, innovated on was making a lot of that stuff electronic. And so there's a lot of props that go back and forth. Um, the students are asked to evaluate their internship midway through and at the end. And the supervisors are asked to, to evaluate the students midway through and at the end. The midway through evaluation doesn't actually count. It's more of like a you know, potential red flags if there's any, or, you know, reassurance that there are. Um, and that makes things a lot easier for everybody. Just, you know, but, um, and of course, we check in and uh, make sure it's going to work as well. Other questions? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe, maybe you'll get to this later. Uh, anyway, but yeah. given that the students have been sort of fine in the ship at the beginning, uh, you know, but what, what's the, the sort of the effect of time in, in an internship on this? Well, uh, usually students find an intern. So, so let me step back a minute. Everybody kind of starts in a different place, right? Some people come in with internships already established because they've been you know, spending weeks looking. Other people come in and they kind of fall into our uh, orientation routine, which gets them moving right away, right? Here's the database. Here's you know, the internship fair where there's employers that are planning that have had an for. You know, your, your faculty member is going to have people that they're going to recommend you to reach out to depending on your interests. And so we try to get them going. Uh, they have a, the ELF form is due, is it three weeks in? Two and a half. Two and a half weeks into the semester. So they have a deadline right at the beginning that they're aiming at. But we fully recognize that not everybody's experience is the same, right? Like some people have a lot of luck at the very beginning. You know, they contact two places and they get an offer right away out of one of the two. Some people will reach out to 20 places and they'll hear back from two and they'll end up with one offer from that, but like you don't know where it's gonna come from, right? So. Um, we try to kind of encourage people along and, and, and urge them to follow the deadline, but also recognize that like everybody searches a little bit. Um, and they'll always reach out. You know, they'll reach out to, to Karen or to Amy or to me and say, hey, you know, I know we're a couple of weeks in the deadline's coming up for the L form. You know, do you have any ideas? And of course, we have uh, organizations that are contacting us and saying constantly, you know, we're still looking for interns, even though it's two weeks in the semester. Do you have a fit? You have somebody that's looking. So we have this constant flow of uh, updates coming in. In addition to, as I said, as what Amy mentioned earlier, the internship database, which is what, 4,000 or something organizations, the people who come to the internship fair. And then I always say, you know, there's no harm in Googling, right? Like Maryland, DC, Virginia, we're all within metro distance. Like not everybody that you could be interning for necessarily knows they need an intern yet. I had a student uh, probably about 10 years ago now who came in and she's like, I want to work in music. I want to have an internship. I was like, okay, well, there's, you know, the, the um, Kennedy Center, you know, there's this, this choral organization, there's this. She's like, no, 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 I want like contemporaries. It's like, well, I don't know that we have anything that does contemporary music. So what do you do? Well, in her case, she started calling record stores. And she started, you know, anybody that had a connection to music at all, and lo and behold, she found that there's a, there's a record store that had um, like a two-story building and on the upper floor, they did like music lessons. 
And that's where her internship was. But she never would have found it had she not like talk, chat, you know, talked with me about it. We've gone through the options that are available to her and then realized, okay, we're gonna have to kind of DIY this internship opportunity. But that's the great thing about it. Like they didn't even know they needed an intern until she reached out and said, hey, I'm interested in doing it. So there's, there's all kinds of different ways. Some people fall into like the pre-established um, opportunities and others create their own. So um, it's great, lots of flexibility. Nearly most, I mean, almost all our students, yeah. with a few exceptions over the years, yeah. they are placed within the first three weeks. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. And yeah. then they work two to three days, based on how many credits they've taken the, the course for uh, per week. And some of them actually do more time because their job is demanding. Yeah. It's very much tailored. I mean, it depends on an individual student's like circumstances. Um, if they want to do more, they can. You know, we work with them in the number of credits they get. Uh, it's just really, you know, depends on the person, depends on the circumstances. Other questions about anything? No? Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Go ahead. Okay, great. So I'm very happy to uh, be able to introduce Danny to the chat with you. So I asked Danny for his most recent one page bio recently. And he sent it to me. And then he also sent a, a, a much shorter paragraph link version. And you know, you're working with a good comms person when they do things like that unprompted. So I have two options here to choose from, Danny. Thank you. I'm going to give you the long one. That's okay. So Danny currently serves as the senior communications advisor for the House Budget Committee uh, on the Republican side, the majority side, overseeing all press relations, digital work, and strategic communications operations for budget chairman Julie Harrington. Danny's worked in a variety of capacities, both in uh, comms and on the legislative side, on the Hill. He's been a foreign policy assistant. He was a foreign policy advisor. He was a comms director for several members, both in the House and in the Senate. Before he went to the House Budget Committee, he was the press secretary and communications advisor for Senator Tim Scott. He was lead legislative staffer for uh, Senator Scott's Foreign Relations Committee portfolio on the Western Hemisphere. Danny is a graduate of the Florida State University. He has a degree in international relations. He participated in the Washington Semester Program in the spring of 2016. And at that time, he interned with Fox News. After he finished at Washington, he continued on at AU and he got his master's degree in international relations in the School of International Service. And uh, I would add one of the perks of my job here at AU is to be able to see students leave Washington Semester and, and go on to bigger and better things. And so it's really been a privilege to watch Danny's career take off. And it's been, uh, it, it will be an honor. It is an honor. Welcome back, Danny. Yeah. Hey folks, so as Dr. Crouch mentioned, I was part of the semester program in spring of 2016. And that is, a pivotal moment for me because prior to the Washington Times program, I had no plan to be here whatsoever. <laughs> I was a big Florida guy. I don't know if I ever told you this. I was supposed to go into like sports journalism. That was like the the no. the, the stick that I was that I was all about. But this opportunity came along from Florida State University to come to the Washington Semester program. Sure, let's do it. Why not? I was approaching senior year, trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. Did it and as you saw in the bio, never on So I came to the Washington Semester Program. I interned at Fox News. That was the actual connection. I, I came in already with the internship, but it's because I was trying to do sports journalism, and they were like, well, we actually do that in New York, not in D.C., but we like your writing skills. Let's see if there's some place we can fit you into the political scene. So that's how I ended up at Fox News. Uh, so I came in with that internship already locked down, and I don't know if you remember this, it was a whole debacle, like a month later, they were like, you're really great, can you work full time? <laughs> and that internship a month into the program turned into a, a full time job. So then I was suddenly presented with the opportunity to work full time as a reporter in the 2016 election, um, and then having to balance my schoolwork here and then having to graduate from Florida State University. 
Um, but ultimately, it was those experiences, the site visits, the 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 learning of what were the opportunities available to me. Like I said, I was never planning on being here, so I had no idea what the DC scene looked like. Right, like when you're a kid like me in Florida, um, I'm a first generation American, don't know too much, so didn't grow up talking about different institutions in American life, et cetera, et cetera. You really don't know what's available until you're actually here. And it was through those programs, uh, through those site visits, through those speakers uh, that I got to really see, case in point with my internship, like they were able to take my skills and find something that, that made it work. And it was those experiences that ultimately ended up putting me on the career path that I am today. And I truly, truly, fundamentally believe I would not have been able to do the things that I've done and be where I am at 29 years old had it not been for my career in Washington Sniper program. So that's why for me, you know, long after leaving, I've maintained a great relationship with Crouch. Uh, as he mentioned, a lot of the people who were in my cohort became some of my best friends. Um, and to this day, we still talk and network. I was a, a, one of the groomsmen for one of the weddings uh through some of who I met here and that couple met in Washington semester program uh so it, it really was you know I don't I don't know if it was just per chance or if, if it's something that you know <laughs> is a recurring thing but for me it really was a, a pivotal moment in my life um yeah so I mean not to bore with so many details but that was sort of the the general experience so if there's any any questions you guys have about sort of how this works? As Crouch knows, I'm a big Q&A guy. I don't like to talk a lot. Um, but any questions, insights from a student perspective, internship, the workload, how we manage all of that, um, was certainly welcome. Yeah? I'd like to hear more about how do you, how do you manage um, the balance between like, uh, full-time work after you receive the full-time work? Uh, job uh, and uh, you know the work needed to uh, graduate. Yeah. Uh, because I had actually one student who after the community internship here, and then and he was over like more responsibility, and the job was more responsibility, and then he asked us uh, asked us uh, whether uh, he could uh, he could graduate without coming back. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but how I answer it, no, but uh, so, but right. if that kind of thing happens, what kind of advice should we give? I mean, listen, I think it entirely depends on, on the person and the personality. I can tell you what sort of my experience was when I came to the Washington DC, uh, when I came to Washington DC through this program, I was ready to hustle for four months, right? So for me, it was, I would wake up in order to, to make time for classes, I would take the early morning shift at five. So I would go to the Town Metro Station at five in the morning, go to Union Station, work, come to class, and go back to work. So it was, for me, it was one of those, like, you can't deny the opportunity in front of you. And for me, it was really the first time in my life I had to learn that in order to do the things that I want to do, you know, you, you have to you have to start making sacrifices. So for me and my personal experience was, I didn't necessarily get to go to all of the fun receptions and cocktails and happy hours that the that the semester program would put together. Uh, a lot of the extracurricular stuff that my cohort used to do, I kind of had to sacrifice some of those because I was focusing so much on work and then um, getting getting school done. Um, I also miss some assignments sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, but it, you know, it, it, it really is the first time for people who are 19, 20, 21 that they have to balance all of those things. And that's life, right? So so I think the, the biggest thing for me is instilling in them this feeling of sacrifice. You're not going to be able to do it all. Like, let's just call it fake. Fake is just not going to be able to. Um, so kind of just making sure that everyone's prioritizing those things and have to sacrifice some of those things, they have to sacrifice those things. That's the grind. Those are the people who rise to the top are the ones who grind. So that would be my sort of moment. Were you a junior or a senior? I was a senior. So spring or fall? Spring. Wow. Yeah. So what I thought- Any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I, because I've had students who've asked about I have one student who's determined like he was getting, he was all set to go this spring to junior this year. And he's like, I'm, I want to do it next year. I want to do 
go to DC and like be there when I'm trying to find a job after a hundred percent. No, so that's what happened with me. Like I, I would have had to turn down a job on this yeah. because I had to go back to school. Like for me, the timing was absolutely perfect, right? Because I'm here, I'm learning DC, I'm already here, you know. Um the job opportunity and then the grad school component too. It, it opened up that window for you know, well, what is the next step? Um I think my takeaway from the program would have been significantly diminished and I had to go back to Florida for a whole nother year and then restart it to come back. So again, everyone's different, everyone takes things differently. I would certainly not shy away from doing it, especially if someone wants has this ambition to go to DC and stay in DC. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in what people who are driven and know what they want. Just I know, like like they, they got it, you know. So so there there's a reason why they have it. So for me, truly, I think one of the reasons why this program is so special for me is because what ended up happening because of it, and I don't think the. Same thing would have been true had I had to go back home for a whole year. Um, because through my internship, um, those people, like my bosses, my editor, everything, those became mentors for yeah. life, you know. So for me, the idea that like I would have had to put that in a freezer for a whole year, I don't know. I don't know. It would have been, it would have been different. It would have been significant. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. That's, and I apologize that I'm standing, but I gotta ask about the elephant in the room. What's the odds on the shutdown? The big. <laughs> um, I think that definitely it is. Reality is right now we don't know. Um, there's so many different structures that a CR could look like. I don't know that the political appetite exists for there to be a clean CR. Um, at the same time, I don't think there's political appetite for us to go through what we just went through a um, month ago. So I think right now that's the debate, right? That's the debate. It, it's my takeaway is that right now we're testing the resolve of the Senate of how what they fold for a ladder CR, when they fold for all of these things. Um, the, the House, I mean, we, we can't, we just can't do this again. So but right now, I, I don't think there's a clear, clear indication that all, all of that one will. Yeah, I appreciate it. That was a really good answer. <laughs> if you are for the international law. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Life, work, school, um, in action, how life was as a student. I'm here to talk about it. Yeah. I'm sort of curious because this came up earlier. Some of the fact that you said almost as important for the students to come here and realize that like, mm -hmm. it's important to be obvious that you came here and sort of had an obstacle to change earlier. Now we're just forced to our own students. Look, how many of your classmates or I guess we can talk maybe about some of the folks who had that opposite experience and like, what was it about the program that you came to DC that like kind of turned them off or like, made them want to be direct there? energy and efforts. I would say the, the the correlation that I would find is the students in my cohort who tended to not particularly enjoy their internships or find them fruitful are the ones who never came back. I, I would say Based on just my cohort experience, that that was sort of the general trend. We had a lot of people who went and entered on Capitol Hill, loved it. I know a couple of them are on Capitol Hill. I know a couple of them went to go work in like a fundraising organization for political campaigns. They now work at that. I know a couple, you know, went on to do some like legal work internships, like one of my best friends, the one that I was a groomsman for. He went back home to Seattle. But he went to law school and now he's a now he's a tax attorney and he did some of that started work here in DC. The couple of people I can think of who like just absolutely were needed in Egypt and like just were spent really their semester frustrated, not liking it, the whole toxic boss situation, this and that. 
those tended to be the ones who, who don't, um, you know, who, who perhaps didn't find the program as fruitful as they could be. Which is why, and I did it, I've been doing this for in the past. This really means an internship is incredibly important. Like making sure that you're matched in place in an internship and that matters more so, perhaps cover your ears, more <laughs> so than the actual instruction and the actual materials that you're learning in the classes. For me, really, the fundamental part of all of this is your internship. Mm -hmm. And making sure that people are happy and fulfilled in the internship and are gaining that real world experience. Um, that I think is the biggest takeaway compared to when you're kind of weighing it of like the coursework and, and, and what you're learning and this and that. You know, the reality is from a student perspective, you didn't come to DC to send a box and learn. You came to DC to have access to internships and networks that you otherwise would have never had. So yeah, interesting topics and classes for sure. But what I have found is the people who found most fruitful the Washington semester program are the people who were able to leverage their internships and the network grew <laughs> through that internship into actual career. Mm -hmm. So that from a student perspective is what I would say the focus should always be top-notch internship. Make sure that the internship situation with the student is figured out. The rest will sort of figure out some about me. And we're not Probably got to be more of that. I'm very curious. I think I know the answer from this to this thought, but you already have an extensive resume at 2019. What specific things did you do on your short network that was a big part in how you got so many positions? How did you leverage that to the best? Of you? Yeah, I mean, for sure, really, and then tying back to the program, it really was. The network. I think one of the things I learned very quickly in DC is it's not necessarily always about the quality of the work that you're putting in. It more so is um, the connections and the genuine relationships you're 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 building. You know, I, th that's why sometimes and you know, as I love the on crowd. The, the 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 B plus he gave me on the internship seminar, and there were most people in the seminar. Who did yeah, that. yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but but for me, really, I was able to use um, that network and and sort of use that as the base for everything. And one of the things that I've always been incredibly appreciative of about um, the the way he, he, he gave me the latitude, especially when Fox turned out into a full-time job, the latitude and the flexibility to focus on that. I don't know if he did that on purpose or by design or it just so happened, but it is one of the things that, that I think that the way he handled that situation is incredibly impactful. Going back to what I was saying, the internship and the network is the most important thing. So really that served as the foundation for everything. Once you're in that first, job that first internship i mean nothing else really matters if you're connecting with your network from that situation so you know from there my i left box and immediately went into the washington examiner which is great to hear that he's talking uh with david mark because david mark was my boss uh he actually david mark actually became part of uh, crowds his circuit because when I was at the examiner, I begged Crouch to come to the Washington Examiner because we have this great guy, David Mark, who's my editor, and he acquiesced and came. And it's nice to hear it's already six years ago. Nice to hear that 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 my old boss is still part of the part of the circuit. So really, the network, the internship, that's the most important thing. So I would say, in terms of people who are in an instruction position or supervisory position of these students, what I would really inculcate is the importance of the internship and the importance of the networking. And not only just normal networking, but actually building genuine relationships. I think that's a fundamental difference because like oftentimes, now that I'm in a position where I have an N amount of intern copies, 99% of intern copies you have, are the most forgettable experiences you have. Mm -hmm. The people who actually break through, and this is, I guess, the long-winded way of answering your question, how do you leverage that? 
are the interns who walk away from my coffee, and I'm like, damn, that was an impressive person. And the people who actually take the time to build a genuine relationship and friendship with me. Those are the people who a year later I will go and back for it every single time. But if you're just gonna end up being yet another intern who hands out yet another business card, you know, I know for these from the intern perspective, I get it because I've been there. Oh, that coffee means the world. Now that I'm in the shoes I'm in and the position that I'm in, the amount of interns that come through my door. It, it, it's just, it, it's about the network and creating genuine relationships. That is what separates you from everyone else. Does that answer the question? Anything else? Oh, there's so many questions. There's so many questions. Yes. Um, so your resume now is obviously very impressive, but coming in the Washington semester program, what did that resume look like? Were you doing a lot of like clubs and involvement in Florida State? Like what how did you prepare? Brass star at Florida State, call out. <laughs> yeah, call out. No, like truly when I tell you that I came into the Washington exam or when the Washington semester program with nothing, I had maybe one dorm off on a campaign. You know, Florida State, Tallahassee, it's the capital. Then a little door knocking for the Republican Party of Florida for Rick Scott's campaign in 2014. I mean, that's it. You know, there wasn't any, there wasn't any really, I don't know, I would say we printed out my resume in 2014, 2015, just not impressive. I don't. So, you know, I think it's a testament to, to what this program can do, right? Take someone who, generally speaking, has a lack of direction, generally speaking, was kind of just vibing in college, you know, um, and really opened their eyes and give them a sense of purpose and belonging. So that, that was my, my experience. How did you find your, how did you secure your internship then? Did you have like a lot of applications, interviews, maybe, or did you? Yeah, so the one thing that I was pursuing really hard so at florida state we have a great communications plus journalism program and it was really like a sports journalism thing i sort of like blindly went with the washington semester program um just because it was kind of like nah just maybe something different that sucked things up a little bit so i went through the program and then i was like okay well journalism and sports journalism is not want to do sports journalism is not what i want to do and I had landed a sports journalism internship with Fox, but it was based in here. So, you know, this was back 2015, because it was spring of 2016. So, 2015, you know, there was no remote work. There was no, it was like, you gotta get your ass in New York or not, or else it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's where. Yes, I impressed them enough during my interview process that they, you know, were like, well, let's try to find something in, in DC. It's, it's political, it's not sports, but it's something, you know, that's meant to And sort of the, the rest of the character. Well, Danny, thank you so much for being yeah, here. You're going to join us for Uh, <laughs> um, we are going to adjourn to the sixth floor now. Um, the, as you go out, go up the elevator to two floors, and we have a lovely lunch uh, up here for you. Danny's going to join us. Some of our internship supervisors are here to have lunch, and we can continue these great conversations up there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.